Hi, this is Joseph Arthur. Thanks for checking out Come to Where I'm From. Please support us on Patreon, patreon.com slash come to where I'm from. We are an independent podcast, and any contributions you can make are greatly appreciated. You have a musical sensibility to you. I do? I think so, yeah. Like, and, and you didn't you work with Liza Minnelli and stuff like that? I worked like, with Liza, yeah. I love so, Liza. I mean, not that many people can say that. Who can that. say I who worked with say, Liza? Who Come can on. say I worked with Liza? And, None of and our then, previous And then say, I do have guests. a musical sensibility? <laughs> yes, you do. Well, you know, I've been lucky to work with... Um, I don't know if you're rolling even now. Yeah, we're rolling. You know... Uh, Rock and rolling. I've been lucky because I worked with, you know, Pete Seeger... Right, when he was 90. 91. 91, right. St- that's when we first started working together. And then I got to do a lot of shows with him and um, and do recording. I got to produce a, a track for him, you know, that I loved the way it came out. And What year was that? That would have been 2012. Oh, okay. And what was the occasion? He had, we had just done a, a, a benefit concert about uh, to raise funds for the cleanup of the oil spill, the BP oil spill. Mm. And... Um, I wanted Pete in the show. I didn't really know him that well, but I asked him if he'd like to be part of it. And of course he did. And he had just written a song that referenced it, the, the spell. Oh, really? And so he started singing all seven verses to me on the phone. Right. And then when it was done, it was a great song, you know, and I said, well, have you recorded it yet? And he goes, no, I just wrote it with my, with my buddy, uh, Laurie Wyatt. And I said, why don't we record it? So we planned a session. Mm-hmm. And it was really cool. I called my friend Matthew Billy, who's an engineer, because at the last minute, also, besides everything else, at the last minute, um, we were trying to plan a session, but uh, Pete decided he wanted to record this on the Clearwater, on the boat. The, the boat, that his environmental, do you know the boat, the Clearwater? No. It's a famous, in 1967, he bought this sloop. Oh, this, okay. And the sloop uh, sails still up and down the Hudson River, and it stops in towns and teaches about environmentalism. Wow. I know in 1967 he started that. Wow! So he, because of the nature of the song, he wanted to sing it on the boat. Yeah. But he didn't really. We had planned a recording session in a recording studio, so it was a whole different thing. So now we had to find electricity for the boat that had no power, you know, uh. on it, and it was really special. It did work out. And what, there's you get a generator. We got something? a generator. We borrowed lots. We borrowed <laughs> it made a bunch of noise, didn't it? You had <laughs> yeah, to put it up on the dock and we, then like we, we, record. No, because you know we were sailing. Oh right. So it's on the boat with us. We just had to muffle it up and cover Muff- it up. Oh, and, okay. And um and it came out good. It's on YouTube and people can watch it. It's called God's Counting on Me. God's Counting on You. Wow. Yeah, that was Pete's last sort of single, you know, track. Yeah. Uh, he still did some spoken word things uh, before he passed, but he was he was amazing, and I always loved him as, even as a child. Right. You know, he was just a special presence. Isn't it wild? So you were familiar with him back then, and then you manifested him <laughs> in your actual yeah. life. Isn't yeah. that wild, the way that works? It's been my, it's been my story. It everyone, this guy. You know, with Donovan, that's another. My, my childhood hero, singer-songwriter, was Donovan. I still, right. I, I'm very close with him, and we work together. We've done several records together, and including a really nice tribute to Harry Belafonte we did in Jamaica two years ago. Wow. And a tribute to Brian Jones of the Rolling Stones. I don't know much about Donovan as a, uh, personally, yeah. but I, I know that he is uh, an individual. Yes. I've caught wind of that. Yeah. <laughs> and, well, you could, I, he's a I, phrase, the song Catch the Wind, so you caught, you've caught wind of it. Yeah, I've yeah. caught wind of it. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, so I respect that in people. Me, of course. People that go against the grain. He absolutely, you know, he was, because he was sort of known as a folk artist who brought a lot of jazz into his music mm-hmm. and other influences, he was unusual. Yeah. At and also psychedelic. Right. Early in 65. Yeah. You know what I mean? So yeah. it's early. He was. And then he had that weird thing in Don't Look Back where he kind of got punked by Dylan and Dylan in his like height of Dylan's <laughs> power. Yeah. You know? Yeah. It's, it's, a, it's interesting to me to think about that because I'm writing about that what era. Do you, what do you think about that? I think that was just that was Dylan's trip at the yeah. time. I, I don't think it really had to do with Donovan. Sometimes people do like take down things. Yeah. You know, and it's weird when geniuses do it. Like, yeah. Dylan's a genius, I but know. still somebody who would do a takedown. Yes. What did he do? Like, he, he criticized him. Take, like, took him down, just kind of like, not aware, just I kind mean. of, I don't know. It was Dylan when Dylan just was like at the height of being fantastic and like the Beatles are at his show and everybody and, and he uh, kind of yeah. like. He said something from stage? I, I no, think no, he was backstage, insecure. Backstage. I think, backstage. I, frankly, it just comes off like, if you look at it like a sort of a psychological, psychoanalytical way, is that 
Dylan was insecure about Donovan because that's the only reason you take people down. Of course. Like yeah. Donovan is a great guitar player, too. Right. You know, like finger picking, very right. precise. I'm not sure if Dylan really was at that point. You right. Know? So um, there was something there. And he had a beautiful voice. Right. And a maybe different good kind looking of sing- or yeah. something. Yeah. And maybe a little bit younger, like uh, five years girls. younger. Right. Hey. Maybe there was a girl, a cute it's, girl it's with got to be a girl. Uh, girls no. were always surrounding Donovan, you know. Yeah. And, so I don't know. So maybe whatever, but. You and know, I don't think Donovan cares. He, I've talked to him about it sometimes. Oh, Ray probably laughs a lot. Yeah, and you know, it's like he liked Donovan a lot. I mean, he liked Dylan and was a fan. And yeah. um, and uh, during in the video of uh, uh, Subterranean Homesick Blues with those signs, yeah. you know, Donovan wrote a lot of those signs for Dylan. Right, and you know what? In, in Dylan's defense of that whole thing, too, it's like we, he was also a kid, and you probably oh, yeah. don't know your own power at yeah. that point. Like, you, he might have just been messing around and having fun. Yeah, and then but then it has this whole weight of gods yeah. attached to it yeah. when you're in that sort of force. Yeah, at first I when I first saw that I was uh, as a kid I saw that that footage and I thought how mean he is. But right. now I don't really think it's that, and neither does Donovan, and that's really what matters because that that's who matters. that's who he was they addressing. And made up. Yeah, there you know uh, yeah, it's, of course. it's all good. It's all lightweight <laughs> stuff anyway. In the end of the day, but it's, it's music. just it's yeah. just funny. It's just funny how these moments can like define people in pop culture history I know, and, I the, know. and you're so embedded in so much pop culture I love it. history man it's wild you know i started so young because i was on the radio when i was seven right in florida yeah and so because of that i sort of started collecting records and learning about artists like like the ones we're talking about right and i was sort of in it even when I, before i was in it you know um, how did you get into the position of being a dj at seven years old chutzpah uh, I'll say. I'll say. I just told the. I, I used to listen to the. It was AM radio. I used to listen to the DJ, and I kind of was. You know how you become familiar with the DJ because you you feel you know them if right. you listen Casey to Casey Case. That was my guy. He's good, but you, yeah. you feel like you kind of know them. So when right. I met him in person, I just said, "I can do what you do," kind of thing. I was uh-huh. seven, and he said, "Oh yeah," and I said, "Yeah," and he put me on the air right then. It was a live broadcast they were doing, uh, and um, and then a light bulb l- went on over his head. He was like, well, "Wait a minute, this is a this is a gag. This will work." I yeah. I was the little DJ, right. and then people people called. There were some good phone calls about mm-hmm. it, and so and they started. Can you come back next week? And then next week, then so I had like a, in the studio. Or you no, this was from this was home? live. No, this was live, and this was actually at you know because I'm this is Florida. I was live on the beach because the show was called Beach Party. Mm. So he had two turntables. He was a real DJ. It was, this is like real DJ before car, it was all carts, you know. Right. And he had two turntables and a setup and broadcasting live from Tampa Municipal Beach. Which is not the greatest beach, by the way. You know, just really kind of funky. But they did broadcast from there every Sunday. Wow. Yeah. And that's where I was there in a bathing suit, you know. And you, did, it's silly. <laughs> how much of that is like kind of like, how much can you relate to like children's stars because of that experience? A little bit, a little bit, because I, I, I that was during a summertime, so I wasn't really in school. But when I got back to school, there was like a, a strange feeling of like, oh, you're on the radio kind of thing. Right. And it was, uh, I can, I have a very, strong feeling about that child star syndrome I, I i can see it in a way in a way because also it doesn't matter if it goes international worldwide or just local even level, local even local it's, it's what it does to the human psychology at that age yeah and whatever like the experience of fame is the experience of fame yeah if you're famous at seven you're famous <laughs> at seven and you know the thing is when you're on the radio you know that you, you at some point not right. at first because you know we're talking like this here now and we're saying how many people will hear this a lot yeah. but we don't know but on when you're on the radio live you, then you at some point it clicks that a lot of people could be listening you know right. and you're communicating with a large number of people and it's a funny feeling yeah. You know that. It's a funny feeling when you know that you're communicating to a lot of people at one moment. So um, I right. felt that. I got a little bit of a fear from that in a way inside, you know, but uh, I didn't show. I just always was bubbly. You, you have to turn that off, though, I think. Yeah. Like, oh, yeah. Like, in order also, of course. Like, especially oh, yeah. now, we're like discouraged from sharing our views so much. I know. Like, so to actually share your views now, I find I almost have to kind of do it in a way where I'm pretending I'm ju- like the, I'm just in a vacuum. Yeah, that's right. I, I do too. I did then too. I don't know that that's smart. N- no, no, I, I think d- I like that. <laughs> I don't know. You can get in trouble. I'll tell you, you can that. get in trouble, but I think otherwise you're not really being tr- really honest with what you wanted to say, you know? Well, and the universe expands itself through you that way. Like yeah. words are so powerful. Yeah. That's why you, that's why they try to shut people from 
holding their power through their words. Right. Well, you know, individuality really is the whole purpose of the universe, I think, is that each individual to express their individuality. Right. And so I, why do you think we're so discouraged to do that in particular in these times? I think it scares people. Honesty is, honesty can be scary. Yeah. And I think it's it's a shame because I do feel like that's really the like universal purpose is individual self-expression. Yeah. And to withhold that is the opposite of what we're supposed to be doing, you know, so. Right. But all, all the sexualities, all the musicalities, all theatricalities, all of those things have to be uh, explored, I think, by somebody. Right. Or the universe, or, not, or things don't progress. Yeah. It's interesting, though, because there's so much, uh, I don't know, there's so much energy towards stifling people's individual self-expression and power and going more towards group think yeah you know that's why i was so lucky i mean if you want to go through my life yeah, at we, all in this do. if you do because you did <laughs> have a hint at that one that's why tiny tim was so important to me what about him well and because when did you meet him i was How? 16 and i had you know i was already because of the chutzpah developed as a dj at seven at that point i was going to meet anyone who was coming through town mm -hmm. in tampa which was not a lot of people but it was some you know mm -hmm. people in music Right. It was not really a big entertainment town. Yeah. But whoever came through, I wanted to meet them. Yeah. And I was in high school when I met Tiny Tim, and he was very... For one thing, he taught me about Greenwich Village. What was the occasion that you met him? Well, he was performing at a really low-grade roadside motel bar. I love hearing this. He I was love hearing no about one. legends going through hard times. Yes. Because it makes me feel... Because <laughs> misery loves company, quite hey, frankly. Hey, I'm with <laughs> you. Know? But, you know, Tiny <laughs> taught is me he about... a legend? Tiny uh, Tim? I don't know. Tiny uh, Tim, uh, uh, he really uh, is a legend. Oh, uh, absolutely. Uh, uh, he's and definitely a legend. He's at one point, he was <laughs> the highest paid entertainer in the world for a moment. Yeah. You know, for it was the end of the 60s. Oh, okay. That when I met him, it was many years later. It was like a decade later I met Tiny Tim, and he was not the highest paid. He was you know, one of the lower paid, right. <laughs> but he was fantastic. And he didn't care about that because he taught me about performing the same for five people or five million people right. or, or 10, you know, I think he said 10 or 10,000 is his phrase. Right. But uh, he, you know, he had a love of music and it wasn't just performing it, it was studying it mm -hmm. and understanding early recordings like wow. the Edison disc, uh, Edison cylinders. And, you know, the re early recorded formats, you know what I mean? Right. And he would loved it and wanted to perform in that style, in, those, in that early, they call it the early acoustic period. Yeah. That was his inspiration. So that's why Dylan and so many artists that were in the folk scene used to go to Tiny Tim for ideas because he knew all these really old, early popular songs that had right. been lost, had been lost. You yeah. Know? That's interesting. Yeah. Yeah, because like, as the world keeps going and as more and more music keeps happening, like people that are actually like culturally, you know, uh, intelligent and have deep memories become more and more valuable. I think so. And I think, you know, certain people will know, not everybody knows that, but you know, the, the aficionados of that kind of music or, or any kind of his music history mm -hmm. were uh, attracted to what Tiny was doing here in the village. So he was a favorite of the folk artists. Right. So when you met him, what did you say? How did you approach him? Well, it was easy because we were we were not uh, allowed to go into the bar because we were underage. Mm -hmm. So we listened at the door. And then when he came out, which he did, he kind of burst it out. It's a bit larger than life personality right. with his ukulele. Uh, he said, how did you enjoy the show? And said, well, we liked what we heard, but we couldn't see because they wouldn't let us in. So he offered to do the entire show for us in his hotel room. Wow, which could be kind of sketchy. <laughs> yes, of that course was, it was sketchy. But I, I was, went right away to the it, bad place. <laughs> hey, it was sketchy, but I was game for whatever was going to happen because I really wanted to hear what he had to say. Right. He did. He legitimately did the entire show for us in his room. That's wild. And it was awesome. You wow. know. And uh, and then I said, "Could do you mind if I come? Can we come back tomorrow and bring a tape recorder?" Right. Because again. I had, <laughs> so I said, yeah. Can, I'd like to record you, you know. And this is, you're 16. Yeah. Right. So I borrowed a really nice professional cassette, but professional deck. Right. And, um, Interesting. And went back the next night and started recording him, and he had great, then it got better. Huh. Then it got educational. Oh, you know? really? Because yeah. he was talking yeah. between songs? And oh, what? he was explaining how he discovered the songs. And he, uh, story he taught us right about, there. like, how he learned about the songs and the writer, songwriters, you know. Who I had never heard of, uh -huh. Henry Burr, all these like characters that were writing these songs in the you know maybe 30s and 20s. Right. So it was very educational, and, and this is in a hotel room in Florida. Yeah, travel lodge. A, a travel lodge, <laughs> no less. Yeah. Wow. 
Amazing. That's a, that's amazing. So what happened to that recording? Oh, we put it out. But but we did more. Okay. Because then I said, why don't we go into a real studio? Ah. So I had those tapes, which were very free form. Uh, and he's just rambling and telling and stories. He's game for all this, even though yeah. you're a 16-year-old kid. Yeah, well, I brought two really key girls from high school with me. Ah. Smart. Smart hey. man. Smart man yeah. over here. <laughs> <laughs> So w that was part of it. Yeah. He loved performing for women. Right. You know, so. Uh, well, and, and there's nothing wrong with that. No. It's that, it's that energy. It it's is that, energy. You know, s sexual energy is, is oh. the energy of life. I mean, you know, me, but, and, and music. It's and, so embedded and in music. What it's do you just, mean we put it out? Like you released the cassette? No, we, we, we put it on a uh, you know, CD. It was, we, finally, I was fine. Because, you know, when I came to New York, it was a few, a few years later. Because he told you to. Uh, yes. But, okay, yes, but, he told me I should be yeah, in yeah. Greenwich Village. So, well, you know, when I was in Florida, I had no record company connections. I did try to contact mm -hmm. like Arista Records, Clive Davis, who I now am in communication <laughs> wow. with now. But then I was not. And I was in high school. And I wrote to labels uh, and they were not, you know, they were kind of were not really into that right now, whatever. Uh, you know, they rejected. So I thought, I don't, I don't know what to do. But then I came to New York and pretty soon started a band. And even then I got signed to RCA, but I really, they were not, I was not in a position to bring them a Tiny Tim album, right. especially of songs from the 1920s and 30s, you know. Right. And, and, and it's also educational. So yes, in a way it it's talking. almost like ahead of its time because it's like something like that, yes. I feel yeah. like would go over now. Like yeah. people would, but then it's like, it was like, People were just getting over like, oh, you can make a record and you can make a 45. What's going to be? Exactly. You know, like, and this was experimental, really. Very experimental. So wait, what, did, what, was the best, what was the best thing he would say to you? And give us some examples of some of the, the uh, There was a wisdom, lot of advice. Oh, my God. A lot of he advice. He talked about being, he would have, he would have almost biblical moments where right. it would be things about purity, like, you know, do what is right and your heart will be light. That's a quote from him. Wow. Do what is right, and your heart will be light. He would yeah. just say that, and he'd be introducing a song, and he'd look at me and say, Mr. Barone, just okay. do what is right, and your heart will be light. And I stayed with those kind of phrases, really stuck wow. with me, you know? Well, that's a beautiful... I mean, Isn't it lovely? Well, it's a song. Yeah. I but mean, it wasn't... It, yeah, it, it wasn't... It should have been. It should be. It should okay, well, be. Okay, well, our first, con our first this collaboration. Is our co <laughs> this is our collab. <laughs> do, what you, do what is right, and your heart will be light. Yeah. You know, a lot of times, though, when you do what is right, and your heart is light the world gets heavy on i know you. that's the that's the I weird know. dichotomy well, it did for him. That, it well did like for him. you know look what happened to G jesus for instance he's I mean, very aware of that he often he, referred to jesus you know <laughs> jesus did what was right i'm sure his heart was light but yeah. the world came down I hard know. i know the world came down like a hammer and you know <laughs> like, it, I mean, yo, it's so dude. i'm right with you like, i that's know that's the weird dichotomy this world provides for you it's not like do what is right but then your heart will be light and the world will go for he's a jolly Good fella. I know. I mean, it, it would be so easy if that was Wait, the case. People don't sing that so to you, Joe. Awesome. I get it all the time. Oh in the my street. god, no! I, <laughs> not getting much of that lately. <laughs> but, but anyway, you know, he ta he taught us a lot, and then we went to the recording studio and did like more form some of the songs because there's one song that he felt was going to be his next hit. Right. And it was called I've Never Seen a Straight Banana. <laughs> it was from 1933. <laughs> That's amazing. <laughs> 1933. Yeah. And I, I said, hey, yeah, let's do it. You know, so we worked out an arrangement of it, and that was going to be the single, you know? Yeah. So, again, the project, I couldn't get a bite from a record company, nor did I know a record company at that time, except by name, you know? Yeah. So, uh, but finally, in 2009, believe it or not, so it's, wow. you know, moving up, Several years, 2009. Years I I contacted a label. I thought you know, uh, Collector's Choice was the label, and um, they do a lot of special projects and stuff. And I told them, and they were interested, and we did it. They were, we gave they gave us a budget to mix and to finish and to overdub because I wanted to add some instruments to the banana song, as mm -hmm. we called it. And um, who kept the the masters? All I kept that them. Time? Like how? Where? I kept it in my kitchen. You just had the foresight. I still have a lot of masters right. in my I mean, house. Tiny Tim's a legend, bro. Yeah, you, but you don't seem to know it, but it's no, like, but, I but don't. like, but like, if you've done that, and plus, also, you had this mystical experience with a master. It's true. Like, it's you're true. not just tossing those tapes. No, around. but like, like, dude, you're you're putting them in the kitchen counter. Right. Like, I saved them. They know, were they were they were preserved right really by well. the vitamins in the pot and some pans. Uh, <laughs> that's <laughs> true. That's right. <laughs> you know, but they were safe and they right. they sounded really good. You know, so we made a good yeah. record. It's called I've Never Seen a Straight Banana. 
uh, it, uh, rare moments, because he would say, these moments are rare, like just these moments of him sharing music with us. Mm -hmm. He kept repeating that phrase, these moments are rare. Yeah. So I made it Rare Moments Volume 1. Wow. I've never seen a straight banana. So that's on, it's on, that's it's on, it's on Spotify. It's really fun. I'm going to check it out. You're really <laughs> making me interested in exploring Tiny Tim. Yeah, he's very, there's a new documentary on him that just came out two weeks ago. Really? Called the, um, it's called King for a Day. And I recommend it. I'm in it. Of course, wow. of course, I have to recommend it. But no, besides <laughs> that, uh, it's based on a, a very good friend of mine who was only 21 at the time, who started to write Tiny's authorized, oh, unauthorized at first, but then became authorized biography. Mm. And uh, it's called The, Impro uh, um, Impro oh, the Eternal wow. Troubadour. Wow. And uh, it's really good. So the movie is based on this, on the book. Uh -huh. uh, and uh, Tiny t always told me that he um, had kept a diary of everything that happened to him. Right. He said, and when I die, they'll find the diary and they'll know everything. So, of course, he passed away in the 90s. So I, uh, I told Justin, who, uh, Justin Martell, who was writing that book, I said, you need to get the diaries. Mm -hmm. And he did, all of them. Oh, wow. Yeah. So, it's, it, you, so in the film, w Weird Al Yankovic does the voiceover reading from the diary. That's incredible. And he does a beautiful job, very sincere well, reading. A, you know, he's a legend too. Yeah, but I mean, and, he, and he, he does it without a lot of looks joking. Looks like a character, I didn't know what he looked yeah, like. He's, oh, yeah, he's, listen a bit. I see can't the, believe, oh, you, you, Dude, I was like, I'm gotta, ignorant on this. He looks no, like a Willy Wonka kind yeah, of type. But, but no, yeah, but incredible. imagine that hairstyle, which we now wear very easily yeah. in the 50s. Right, because he started wearing the long hair in the fifties. Now, what was his what was his take on Jesus? Was he a Christian or what was? His well, he was he, again. It was very complicated. He was right. Jewish and Christian. He was father. Right. Father was Jew, uh, mother was Jewish and father uh -huh. was Christian. He took on. He just he he was very spiritual. But right. he really he identified. He I don't want to say identified, but he um, he would often mention Jesus. Right. Let me say that. Yeah. And he would use the New Testament references a lot. Huh. Praise Jesus. I mean, he would say that after a song, after he got through his song. Yeah. He was very grateful. Yeah. It was beautiful, like really. A you know, and it's a very, it was a very, at first we thought he had to be kidding because right. he's, he literally was quoting from the Bible sometimes. And we thought he was, you know, we were 16, and he thought, this is, he's not real. So this is a gag. He was absolutely real. Yeah. But, but it was mixed in with all this like New York subculture and his obsession right. with Tuesday Weld and the, his sexuality, which tended to be, he really, uh, loved lesbians. Really? He was, his attraction was to lesbians. Yes. That's interesting. And that was a driving energy for him. And he performed here in the village in lesbian bars. That's wild. Yes. So he was a New York. He would cat. say, "I'm the only man. I'm the only man." Giggle that they would let in the room. He would say to me. So yeah. I wonder if he identified as a, a female or had that. Must have maybe had, I would maybe, say maybe went back and forth. Or yeah, something. yeah. I think part I mean, of it. We're all so complicated. Oh, it's so complicated. <laughs> I mean, like it's like come on. It's like this is like. And and that was an education for me about sexuality at that age too, right. because I realized how fluid it could be. Yeah. And he was loved women. He really loved women, but he loved women almost as a woman. Right. Yeah. In a way, I'm not. Yeah. I don't want to read into more than, but that's kind of how you could look at that. Right, you know? that's interesting. Well, yeah, I mean, it make it would make sense for that to be what you're dr more drawn to. Yeah, and so, you know how he sang. You know his voice. Yeah, so. yeah, yeah. He sang. I mean, yeah. I can't even. He do sang it, in but, high falsetto. <laughs> really, like freaky high. Falsetto. Very special. Yeah, I'm gonna beautiful though. Gonna, beautiful. Uh, beautiful. On no, the ride good. home. We're gonna yeah. listen to yeah. Tiny good, Tim good, Joe. good. Vo really good vocals. Really good vocalist. Yeah. Ex except he's so eccentric. He kept when we were driving Very to the studio. Eccentric. If you don't mind us staying a little bit, I know we have other things no, we want to talk. No, no, man. But, we got all day. Okay, when, but you when know, when do we get a chance to bring Tiny Tim up? <laughs> no, it's true, and he really was very special and unique, and I think somebody who you, you know. You would the more you know about him the more you'd actually like you know yeah well the more i'm learning about him the more i like him for sure but he was for a producer because i was i was producing this record right because i said i'm a record producer i was not really right. uh -huh. right. well but you were though <laughs> yes i you was there's another I example was. of manifestation instant manifestation you, but, you, you, you like first and go biblical too first came the word that's right you speak it and it yeah. be, you know that we and speak I'm a producer but he was the first producer that artist that i produced outside of my own little world of like musicians and right. my band you know so this was a big deal for me but i said yeah i'm a producer so but he insisted on eating 
uh, spiced popcorn on the way to the studio. And this was a long drive. I was p driving him in my very small car, by the way, and he was a big guy on the front seat. So people could actually, we played a ukulele. So people knew him. He was very famous. Mm -hmm. And people could see him, and cars were stopping, traffic was stopping, brakes were screeching because they could see mm -hmm. Tiny Tim in the front seat of my car. He would be on the Tonight Show oh, yeah. and stuff. And, and then that I was know. like critical mass. You got I on know. the, t back, you know, now you get on the Tonight Show and you might as well make an Instagram post. It's the <laughs> he same was married. Thing. It's like, yeah. Like, like, I know. Like I know. then, it was like, you're on The Tonight Show, everybody knows who you are the next day. But he was even married on The Tonight Show. Right. On, he was married on, live on The Tonight Show. Really? Yeah. Who did he marry? A young, beautiful young girl that was a fan, Miss Vicky. Ah. Right. Yeah. How old was she? I think she was uh, maybe maybe 18. Right. The most. And, and how old was he? He would have been... And a lesbian? No, no. I don't think so, no. <laughs> But, you know, he had to make some concession. Listen, that, that was like, you know, I mean, that, that excitement, that uh, I interest might have been earlier. I can't that's, believe I never heard of this guy. But it's he, just insane. He, he, uh, it as is far nuts as, that you I haven't. Know. I yeah. can't believe you haven't either. Well, you, you um, that's why I'm here. That's why I'm here. You got yeah. a rabbit hole to go down. Yeah, 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 yeah. yeah. he's really cool. But the thing was that, um, yeah, he was married on the Tonight Show. It was the largest viewing audience of anything except the moon landing in the 60s. That's so it was the moon landing was number one in 1969. Probably equally as fake. Yeah, hey, we're <laughs> I, I'm, yeah, 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 I'm yeah, here yeah, all day, yeah, but yeah, anyway. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> True. Stanley Kubrick, the Stanley, 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 Kubrick. Stanley Kubrick production of the moon yes. landing. That was the first, that was number yes. one, but of course it's Kubrick, so it had to be number one. Right. And then the uh, number two was, you know, uh, the marriage of Tiny Tim and that's, Miss Vicky. That's wild. Miss so Vicky. he was very famous. Okay. Mm -hmm. You know. Uh, very. So you're driving him to so the we're studio driving him. He, so he has with him a hefty bag. Not a not a small bag, mm. a hefty a garbage bag, a gar like a hefty bag filled with popcorn, mm. spiced, very spicy, and he keeps eating it because he says, "Mr. Barone, it's good for my voice." He's calling you Mr. Barone. Oh yeah, he called everybody Mr. Mr. Dylan, Mr. Barone, Mr. This, Mr. And Miss. <laughs> the girls are Miss, you know. Wow. Miss Vicky was his wife. It's Miss Vis. It's Miss Vicky. Mr. Burrow. Mm. <laughs> so anyway, he's eating, the, and then he could, the vocals were difficult. I at first I had to really warm up because the, it was not good for his voice to be eating popcorn before singing. So f for all your listeners out there, don't eat spicy. Popcorn not before singing. singing. Yeah, but we got a good, really good recordings. Interesting. And it came out finally in two thousand one. So uh, two thousand nine. Proper studio, proper recording. Yeah. Well, proper in Tampa standards. It was a four track studio. I mean, I would have liked a twenty four track. You no, know, a small studio. We got it good. We got it done, though. Did you play him any of your music ever? A little bit, but it was really punk at that. I was very punk. Right, and what did he think to it? I think he seemed to like, he seemed to dig it. He, he later got into punk a little bit. Yeah. He played with some punk groups. Right, but it wasn't his bag necessarily. His favorite was really old music. Right. But he was open, you know, and, you know, when we were with him, he would be trying to do cover versions of songs that were on the radio, and it's really funny. He did a really funny version, but I only got a few seconds of it because he didn't have the whole song down, of Janice Ian's at 17. But he did it in full falsetto. Right. I've, l I've yeah. learned the truth. I've learned the truth at 17. You know, yeah. that love was meant for beauty queens. You know, and it was, That's of course, <laughs> because it, sounds like it. anytime a phrase like beauty yeah. queens was in a song and he sang it in falsetto, you know, you know who's going to get some audience reaction, you know, yeah. so he knew what to sing. Right. It was, it was also like it was this cross between like. It, there was something funny about it, but also not. It wasn't a joke. It was yeah, serious. It was both. Ser both at the same. It was time. both at the same time. It was, it was obviously he was on the Laugh In Show, which was the, one of the biggest comedy shows of the '60s. Right. He was a regular on the Laugh In Show. Yeah. Or semi regular. So he leaned into his eccentric yeah. eccentricities. And he didn't mind if people laugh because he was still doing his music. Yeah. You know what's interesting is I always found a relationship between him and Mark Bolan. Well, I, you know, Mark Bolan is my absolute favorite. Artist. I know that's why I bring yeah. him up, and I remember hearing or in your documentary about you having a dream with Mark visiting you. No, oh, that's true. Yeah, and I asking did. you if you're gonna make a that I love this make a record or just a collection of songs. Right. Because every one of us who's make records, yeah, we, we can relate to that question. Yeah. And that is such a that's such a call out of a question. I, Isn't it? it it's it, the it, ultimate call. It just made me think, am I making a record right now or just a collection of songs? Right. And if I'm making just a collection of songs, <laughs> how do I make it a record? Yeah. Well, that's how the Cool Blue Halo, which you're wearing the t-shirt of, that's right. how that, that was the result of that. Right. So we created a, 
atmosphere for that. It was live. It was recorded live, but we this made at Tony, the Blue Tony, Note. Tony Visconti. And no, no, at, no at this is before. I, this is before at the bottom, at the line. bottom oh, line. This was before I worked. I knew Tony, but I hadn't worked with him yet. He was still in England when right, I made that. Right, right. He manifested Tony Visconti. Well, you know, I had to work with Tony, and I love I working with him and to, yeah. and co-writing. We we did we co-wrote all the songs on that album. Because Electric Warrior is like the greatest. Oh of, yeah, of all time, maybe it one really is one <laughs> of them. I mean, definitely like the most perfect rock and roll record you could imagine. I know it's absolute perfection. everything. Thing. like it's just it's you know it's songs. like it rocks and it's elegant it's and it's elegant. like yeah. so elegant and yet it rocks you know that's a comp- drum just sound, that even the drum sound alone rocks and is elegant and, and the you know strings and he does the arrangements on the that string part. arrangements he writes uh, you know he writes them quickly he's a he's a genius mark bowen at the ty- height of his powers i know and he discovered mark bowen too tony because he was about 19 or 20 or so when he had some he had success in England, and they they told him he could sign and act, and so that same night he went out and saw Tyrannosaurus Rex, which was the original T Rex, mm-hmm. the full name of Tyrannosaurus Rex, as an acoustic duo, right. very eccentric, performing at a place called the UFO Club, right. and he said, I, "I want to sign you," and they did work. They signed, and so they made about maybe. Well, they made a fo- four records as Tyrannosaurus Rex, and right. then maybe another four or so as T Rex. Right. So you know they did a lot of albums together. Tyrann- so seventy seven. Tyrannosaurus Rex was just bongos and Mark, right? Yeah. Basically. And weird instruments. And weird instruments. Yeah, because yeah. the original partner Steve Took played a lot of toys and things. Right. Like toy instruments and things, and then with acoustic guitar. So it was a different kind of folk music. Right. It was like from the British folk tradition, like the groups that were coming out, like Newport. Uh, the, the, w- there were several there were a lot of folk Fairport convention, air, Fairport convention things like that but there were, that was the vibe in a way but this was like an eccentric more, a little more eccentric version mm-hmm. I think you know um, beautiful stuff but quirky you know so when he visited you in, in your dream what record were you about to make that Cool Blue Halo Cool Blue yeah, Halo yeah because this was I was in the bongos but I was right. starting to do shows here in this neighborhood because I had moved to the village and I kind of wanted to play acoustic stuff like I kind of got the you know I got the spirit of these venues because right, before that the bongos was more electric more yes. punk more pop pop punk, pop, 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 punk. And, yeah and we were playing big sh- at that point we got to the, quickly got to the point where we were playing big t- arenas like playing with because our agent was a big um you know booking agent and they would book us with these big bands at the time like the 80s bands so we were playing huge venues suddenly like Red Rocks and and um you know if for us it was large Jones Beach, Jones Beach, like those kinds of spa- uh, sheds. Yeah. And I was getting farther and farther away from kind of the, this. Yeah. And I thought, okay, I wanted to do like something like this, like in a club right. like this. More intimate. So I started playing these little clubs in the village uh, as a solo artist. What, At, what clubs were around that? Well, it was a club, especially, well, there was a couple. One was called King Tut's Wawa Hut in East Village. I think we heard that. It was pretty somewhere. awesome. Well, that, that's weird because there's King Tut's in, in Glasgow. Oh, wow, cool. And I, th- I think that's King Tut's Wawa Hut in Glasgow. That's cool. I'm wrong. No, you might be right. But this anyway. was on these. This was like Avenue A or something. Or Can first, you look first up King Tut's? Yeah, yeah. So King Tut's Wawa Hut was fun. And, you know, we, that was a very uh, cool venue because we would have an opening act. Like one was these two guys. Um, one was completely naked but covered with cake batter. And his friend would play a drum. Yeah, King Tut's Wawa Hut in Glasgow, UK, live music bar. So maybe it's named after the I've East played, Village. I've played there a bunch. Cool. I, didn't, I didn't know that its roots were in the East e- Village. East Village, yeah, really deep East Village. That's wild. It's so, a great club in in, in, uh, in Scotland. Cool, cool. Yeah, in Glasgow. Well, we yeah. had fun playing there, except that the cake batter, the, the guy with the cake batter all over his body uh, did this dance that would spin around, and the cake batter went all over our instruments before our set. Mm-hmm. So that was the <laughs> only problem, because like we had a cellist. cake batter. I know. We had a cellist with like a really rare, expensive cello, and right. it was James Carpentoni who played with us. Oh, and she's still around. Yeah, oh, yeah. Yeah, I played with her. I and think I did Letterman with her one time. Yeah, I think you did. Doing, I think I saw that. It was Lou. on Avenue. Yeah, because she a, played with Lou a lot. Yeah, side, yeah. Avenue A and 7th Street. Avenue A, right. King that was, that's wow, wow. It was super fun. Experimental theater space on the Lower East Side of New that's York. That's played there. We played there. Operating in the mid 80s and 1990s yeah. I mean King Tut's in Glasgow Oasis played one of some of their first shows like it's a legendary space there too anyway it was really fun to play so there Jane had cake batter we all had cake batter and not only on the instruments but on us but because they were it was a small venue and we were just it was fun though mm-hmm. yeah, it was again experimental but but we did we started doing the songs that were on that album so then I was playing also a place here called the speakeasy right. that had a 
thriving scene. That's where Suzanne Vega came out of. Okay. The speakeasy. Ah. It was a cool, it was sort of like this, a little larger. Yeah. With a small sort of stage, but rounded, I think. Yeah. And uh, I started playing there, just a trio, myself on acoustic, well, not really acoustic, electric guitar, oh. a friend on acoustic, and then a cello. Okay. Then later we added a percussionist and made that album. That was like, that was done at the bottom line. That was our big gig, because the bottom yeah. line was a larger club. It's huge. It was 400 seats for two shows. So you, know, you, get, you get a good number of people in there. You know, and everyone know. went through there. I mean, yeah. early yeah. Springsteen. Lou played there, yeah. everybody. Yeah, it was because Vince Skelso, a DJ on, uh, at the time, I think WNEW radio, invited, he was doing a Sunday night series. W N E W. Yeah. So he asked us to do this show, and we <laughs> yeah. did it. It was part of his uh, m series. monthly or yeah. series, you know. And it, we, I said, wait a minute, we should record this. So I got a, we got a truck. In those days, now we would just bring an iPhone <laughs> to record it or, or something. A laptop. A laptop. Yeah, yeah. But yeah, a laptop really. But yeah. but it was a truck. A, a big. It was a big deal. Like we had a truck and microphones everywhere. We really did it. It was like a rec making an album. Right, it's and a we did. Budget. Yeah, we had a budget. We got a budget. I called the record label. I said, "You know, I'm doing this show. Do you want to record it?" And they, they did want to. So was it an album or a collection of songs? It was an album. <laughs> it had it floats. We created a, a vibe, and we there was a lot of incense on stage and a lot of crystals, gigantic crystals everywhere. Yeah. We just made something that was just Is that different. Code for weed and crystal meth. No, it was. <laughs> <laughs> yes, it could be. It could have been. It could have been, but it wasn't. We had, <laughs> right. we had like it was like more like you know rose quartz right. and yeah, you know, but it really was incense and crystal. But it was really beautiful. But it yeah. was like really dark on stage, and it, we had a great vibe. Was yeah. there an early and later? It was yeah. one show. No, we did early. That thank oh. God we did early and late so we could edit you in case there was because you know oh, yeah. my solos were they're all improvised. So I was like at least I could choose from two right, if right. one I liked, you know. So did you pick and choose or did you? It's mostly first show, I think. Mostly first show. Yeah. Ain't that the way it always first is? First take is yeah. always first the take. take. Yeah, but I think maybe some had better maybe some of the endings because we had never rehearsed with the percussionist before. Yeah. She had just come to my apartment, which was on Perry Street then, the night before to rehearse yeah. the songs, and she's playing like big timpani and stuff. So yeah. You couldn't hide it on a live album, you know. Right. So some of the endings I think were a little bit better on the second show. So I might have like just taken the ending uh, from a second. But that's all. Mostly it's first show, and it flows, and it's an album. It's pretty solid. Well, that kind of energy is good though. Like that energy of like that figuring it out on on the oh yeah at the moment. Oh yeah. Like some of you you want to cross between really rehearsed and also figuring right. it out right in the moment like so that's, that's what best. that album is all about and i've rarely done that with that's, such that's trust great. trust you know i had a lot of yeah. trust in what we were doing because we've been gigging in these little intimate clubs that gave me a lot of tr and it gave all of us a lot of trust the vibe was so good at these venues like even the, with the cake batter it was yeah. like a good vibe with support and we felt so when we got got to the bottom line in the same neighborhood which kind of just like continued that right you know well tell me about how you got from you know Tiny Tim in the hotel room at 16, mm -hmm. all the way to that place, like vis-a-vis -vis the, <laughs> the bongos and all that yeah. kind of stuff. Like, how'd you get your start? Did you go to college? How I did. did you, I did go. I was taking did, film. Okay. And, yeah. and, 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 what, and then how'd you start into the music career? What did you study in the film? Okay. I was studying. I really love film and acting. Mm -hmm. And I uh, love uh, avant-garde film and, inter, and you know international okay. stuff, you know, in, indie films. Uh, so I was studying about that, learning about Jonas Mekas, who I later, who became one of my biggest mentors of all. Mm -hmm. and Andy learning, Warhol's uh, guy. Yes, right. yes. And, you know, Kenneth Anger, who I got to work with and who curated my shows at Joe's Pub. It's amazing. Mm -hmm. But uh, uh, the, the way I got here to New York, though, was through the monkeys. Wow. That's interesting how that happened. Uh, similarly to how we met Tiny Tim, the monkeys, the two of the monkeys mm -hmm. were touring as the monkey show coming through Tampa. And again, I went to go Wh meet which them. Which two? Davey and Mickey. Of course. And, which two, he asks. <laughs> and this is like, the, this is the late, this is the seven, late 70s, you know? Yeah. So it's like, you know, they were playing through town and they were, um, I noticed their band behind them because there's two of them, but the band was familiar to me. It took me about half the set mm -hmm. till I realized I knew them from the CBGB, live at CBGB album that had come out. Yeah. You remember that there was like, a, I don't know if you know that there was a double just at the beginning of the punk movement, movement, if it was a movement, and I think, I guess it was, that beginning of punk music, yeah. there was a double album on, I think it was one of the Atlantic subsidiaries, and it was called C Live at CBGB's, and it's all these bands that played there. Some of them became famous and some did not. One of them was called The Laughing Dogs, right. and I knew from their picture in there that they were the backing band for the monkeys. So later after we met, we were meeting them, we said, oh, isn't that the Laughing Dogs? And they were like, yeah, yeah, come meet them, you know. 
I was with a, g- a girl from school named Jean, and um, she and I said, yeah, we want to come to New York sometime, you know. Anyway, we got invited to come stay in their loft. They were in Brooklyn. Oh, okay. That's how I got to New York, really. That's cool. Yeah. yeah. And we just stayed, and she, she and I stayed, and she, she got a job on a television show called As the World Turns, a soap opera, and they got me on the show somehow. Really? Went through an audition. I had to actually audition, but that got in. That's crazy. So then I was on the show, so then I was, you know. That was a very popular I know. soap opera. I know. I mean, that's huge. I was on for like a minute because then I uh, threw an ad in the Village Voice. There was a, a band putting an ad out looking for a guitar player into Velvet Underground, Lou Reed, you know. Um, but wait, what, how, what did you play on As the World Turns? I played a boy. Yeah. Named Eric. Really? Yeah. But this was like, and this was, like, and it was only a like boy a boy named Eric. On hey, as the world. Turns. Our next <laughs> title. Our song, next. A boy named our Eric. next collaboration. Yeah. That's the name of the album. Yeah. <laughs> a boy named Eric. It was like, ex- it was really, it was to be honest, it was extra work. But I was happy right. to get it because I that was my first paycheck, yeah. really. You know. And that got and plus, me. Plus, then too, there was only three TV stations. I know that was the height of the media. So I know you made it there. It's Some more like fame. My mom saw it. Pretty big in Tampa. In you know, a weird way. Even if it's just extra. It work. was funny. It's it was kinda, fun. It was fun. It also got me in, uh, a membership in an AFTRA. Right. So that was good. Okay, so somebody puts an ad out <clears> for <throat> Into the Velvet yeah, Underground. Velvet Underground. It mentioned some other bands, all that I loved. Uh-huh. Uh huh. You know, it might have even mentioned T Rex right. and I Bowie or something. And I said. Yeah, so I answered it. They were really nice. We became a band. That was you know? the bongos. Yeah, yeah. At first it was called A. It was called A. Yeah, it was with Glenn Morrow, who later started a band called The Individuals, and who started a, la- a cool label, very cool label, who I did record an album for, called Bar None Records. Right. Uh, so, but Big the, label. Yeah, it was good. It's, it still is very good. Still works. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So, the but three of us kind of splintered pretty quickly and became the bongos. Okay. And started playing our neighborhood. Oh, we lived in Hoboken. That was where we found a place that was affordable. And you know, all three of us, three the three bongos could live in the same apartment for uh, that was large, for eighty eight dollars a month. Mm. So that was cool. Was the path? Did the path exist back then? Yeah. Oh yeah. Hoboken? Path had been there a long time. Yeah. Oh, path okay. was old. To me, I had never even heard of. To be honest, as much as I should have known of Hoboken, I had never heard of it before. Right. Uh, but but if New consciously. York was seedy in the '80s. How was Hoboken? Hoboken as was seedy? Hoboken was like a a, a a time warp. Hoboken was like the 1950s. Ah, it amazing. was pretty clean. It was like very. But but beyond that, it was literally in the '50s because like the storefronts would have those mannequins. All all the storefronts looked like they were '50s. Mm. And there were no chains, no except for a Blimpies, which was like the like a, almost like Subway the sta- sandwich. Yeah, yeah. The, yeah. the only thing that was a chain in the entire city was a Blimpies. Mm. Blimpies number one. <laughs> <laughs> the rest of it were mom and pop stores that had been there forever, and they had the same things in the window that they would have had in ni- sort of 1958. I think you know. Right. It was old school, so I liked it. You know, for a lot. Of, that's why the bongos. If you look at photos of us, we were dressed like that because we would go to the shops there and buy 50s shirts yeah. and pants and that's shoes. A cool look. Yeah, we had, and it was not. It was really from our neighborhood. That was our neighborhood look. You know. Right. So they were thrift, the thrift stores there were just great because they weren't attacked by people buying cool thrift store things you know they just had they had everything still there and you guys got a deal pretty quick we got a deal really fast with a a great label in england called fetish records and fetish was industrial rock so it was like throbbing gristle and these you know kind of other kind we were pop but they really liked us and signed us fast and uh, based on what they saw you where yeah live at maxwell's they happened to be there the the owner was only 21 years old and he had just you know started the label and he saw us and he said he wanted to sign us he had a contract ready yeah what year was this that would have been like we probably signed maybe i guess early 80 1980 I love that venue, yeah. Maxwell's. It's I know. Well, that bad. was our... Yeah. It's closed now, right? Yeah, it's, yeah. It's too bad. It was great. But that was our... Uh, Maxwell's was the place where we used to rehearse. Mm. And it was not really a venue yet. It was a restaurant. Right. And our drummer was the cook. Yeah. <laughs> and, <laughs> That's funny. And, and what? The back room is the venue now? Well, the back room was where they would store food. That was like boxes of stuff. So they'd let us... That became the venue, right? Yeah. The back room. Yeah. But they used yeah. to let us rehearse back there. So, so that was great. It was free because of you guys that that became a venue probably? Hey. From that back Well, space? we started playing in the front. We start in the rest in the middle of the restaurant. We'd clear some tables and we'd play there. But you know, we were already playing at Max's Kansas City in, in Manhattan too. So we met a lot of bands like the Flesh Tones and mm. these, you know, cool bands really. Right. And we'd say, you know, there's a place in Hoboken. It's Ma- it's awesome. It's Maxwell's. It had really just started, but we just kind of got them to come play there. Yeah. So pretty soon everybody's playing there. And of course, the guy that uh, uh, one of the owners, Steve Fallon, was a great booker. 
Yeah. We didn't really have to do much, but we did suggest to certain bands like, hey, check out Hoboken. Well, it's a great play because you're going to yeah. get some people from the city. Yeah. But you're going to get a whole new audience. And, yeah. And it's not going to wear out your city plays. So right. That's like, right. a working band. It's like yeah. it was it was a perfect aside, like another gig. It was close yeah. by, easy to get to. Yeah. And for bands coming from England, it was a good first New York gig. Right, right. Because they could warm up the show without yeah. a ton of critics. You get some critics there. Yeah. But not a, not a ton. You know, you, you could just kind of slip by at first at Maxwell's when you yeah. did your first show there. Yeah. So, and so you guys, did you guys have some radio success mm -hmm. or how did you get popular? We did. What, like, because it was we did. It's a great band. We had, I mean, thank you. We did good records. Yeah, you know, we really, really tried. We really tried to make them sound unique and cool. And again, with knowing the records that we loved and the kind of yeah. the stuff that we liked, we tried to make it sound really good and, and unique. Right. So, and what 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 do you think it's most like? Like, if you name like five bands that kind of like just for people that don't aren't familiar. It's hard for me because what we liked at the time, I really liked music. Like I liked fifties music, like Buddy Holly. Right. But I also like dance music, mm -hmm. so we tried to find a, something in the <laughs> something that kind of had dance beats, mm -hmm. but with acoustic strumming. Also a Beatley vibe. To we me. had a beat. We loved totally the, we, Beatles. We loved the, I we like I felt. We did. We loved the early. We loved the early Beatles. Like, right. We listened to the like. I had Funny a lot of. that you say that, Joe. On the way here, I was yeah. listening. Yeah, yeah, we loved the like, Beatles. Let me see what Great does it songs. sound like. Yeah. And it was Beatles. Yeah. And punk. And. Early '90s alternate yeah, rock. You're right. But yeah. You guys were a decade pre. I know. I know. Yeah. Yeah. We were. Yeah, it's actually pretty advanced. Thank you. I think so. I think so too. <laughs> but you know what we did was, uh, yeah, we loved the Beatles. We like the we like the early, especially the early Beatles. Like right. we had. I worked in a record store when I was in high school in Tampa, and I started collecting illegal bootlegs. We eventually the FBI Same came here. in here. Yeah, I love bootlegs, and <laughs> we we had like the Beatles live in you know Hamburg and. A cavern club that was our a lot of our inspiration excuse me a lot of our wow. inspiration was that was uh the early beatles you know so a lot of our when we would do covers which we had to do because i wasn't writing that fast yet right and we needed songs we would do the songs that the beatles covered uh -huh. like not beatles songs yeah, yeah hardly ever a real beatles song but the songs that they covered right. on those like blue like yeah and that even recorded like boys that was one of our like the drummer our drummer would sing boys ringo used to sing the song boys by the shirelles yeah. which was a little bit sexually ambiguous but of course that's good, you know. That is good. But I mean, it was like boys, you know, talking about boys, you know. The, that yeah, Ringo yeah. sang that, and our drummer would sing that. So it was like it was a cover of yeah. the cover. It's like a little bit of edge, kind yeah. of for free. It's yeah, no big deal. exactly. It's just I like know. A, just a little spice. Yeah, a little spice. A little you need free. a little spice, you know. <laughs> it's a little spice, yeah. <laughs> but yeah, so we, that's how we kind of started. So we, you know, we started getting gigs, and uh, I had to write a lot. I started writing a lot of songs then. So were you the sole writer? At first, yes. Okay. At first, yes. Then later, when we signed to RCA, we, you know, on the recordings, I would overdub usually an acoustic and electric guitar playing the exact same thing. That was mm -hmm. part of our sound. And that came from Bowie, in a way, in my head, Bowie, Bowie, because like Ziggy Stardust has this, he's playing this hard strummed mm -hmm. 12 string, and then M Ronson, mm -hmm. Mick Ronson is playing this, you know, grinding Les Paul through a stack of amps, you know, mm -hmm. and that combination of the acoustic clearness and then the dirty, yeah. distorted electric mm -hmm. was kind of something that we did, I did on the records. Yeah. So then live... We had to do that. So I, we, all, we had different guest guitar players playing acoustic, and I'd okay. play electric. And then uh, finally, James Mastro, because the first band was myself, Frank Giannini on drums was awesome, and Rob Norris on bass, who had actually played in the last uh, wave of the Velvet Underground, when huh. they were called, they were like, Lou had left, everybody had left, but Rob was the guitar, one of the guitar oh, players. Oh, really? yeah. was Velvet yeah. Underground even oh, it without went on. Lou? It went on. Really? It went on, yes. I did not know because that. Because through, through long, I don't know this full story, it's too, way too long and I don't understand it, but the management, Selznick, or somebody, sell, David Selznick, he like kept them going, even though Lou had left and John, had, Kale had left. Wow, and, once, once Lou's gone, come on. Oh, come on. Give me a break. I know. Same. Uh, I mean, it doesn't I, I make like sense. Some of the, I like the Velvet Underground records without John. I mean, obviously yeah, of I course. prefer it with John. Of course, of course. But like, those are still good, good, great Lou as records. As long as Lou is there. Yeah, they're great Lou records. You know, they're great They're great records. Like Loaded, isn't Loaded is without it's, John. Yeah, it's without I mean, John. That's and, a great record. There's some great songs on like, it. I just did it with the Feelies. I was rock and Roll, and, and, uh, yeah. you know, Sweet, isn't Sweet Jane? Sweet Jane. Sweet Jane. I mean, no, the whole on. album is beautiful. That's Sweet Nothing. Yeah, yeah, sweet yeah. Nothing. Oh, is yeah, on. no, it's beautiful. That record is great. I love it. It's fantastic. And isn't, let's see, this. Yeah, I mean, I'm, 
I really gr- had grown because at first I liked the first albums the best. Of course. But then I got to really appreciate Loaded later too. I love yeah. it, you know. And mm-hmm. we just did it. I performed it with the Feelies. We did a, we did a lot of songs from Loaded in this concert. There's going to be an album. I think it's a Feelies live album coming out. Wow. And I sang. I think I sang. I think Sweet Nothing or a couple songs with them. That's uh, a great one. I love it. It's you know? beautiful. So I got to meet Lou. One of my first things in New York was meeting Lou. Yeah, you I was of, 18. Were, were you friends with Lou? Oh, you yes. Were I was Lou. very close yeah, friends yeah. with Lou. And it was a whole life long because I met him when I was 18, when I first came to New York. Right. And my guitar, I came by train. And my guitar, we got totally beaten up on the on the train ride. Somehow it had, I didn't detune the strings. They were, it was all taut. And somehow it got bashed around and the neck was like falling off. It was right. terrible. So mm. I went, someone said, you got to go to 48th Street and get a new guitar. Mm. And that's where you ran into Lou. Oh my God. He was right the there. I was like, Lou, Reed, my hero. And Lou. he was in a shop trying out some bizarre looking clear Lou site. You know, he loved like weird guitars. Oh, he loved gear. <laughs> yeah. Yes. Yeah. yeah. He's a, and, and computer and tech. And I all know. That. He loved it. I know. So he had. He was looking. Yeah. He was playing some bizarre, like space guitar. It was a lucite, clear right. guitar, guitar. And I was like, "Well, that's cool." And I said, "Mr. I think I called him Mr. Reed." But of course, that comes out of my Tiny Tim thing. You know? <laughs> right. I said, "I'm. Re- I just. I love Which your." He probably. Re- he probably. Said, he probably responded to that. I think I said, "Mr. Reed, I just. I love your music so much. I just wanted to say hello." You know. Well, yeah. He was really nice. He was like, well, "What are you doing in here?" I said, "I'm looking at guitars." And he says, "Well, what do you." What do you like? And I said, well, I like the Velvet Underground. I did say that. Right. I said, I like the Beatles. Yeah. And he pointed to a Rickenbacker. Yeah. Now, at the time, Rickenbacker were not very popular guitars. Right. They were not. This is pre-REM. Interesting. Wow. Uh, Rickenbackers <laughs> were the one. Of the, in fact, it was hidden in a corner. It was a beautiful 1965 blonde Rickenbacker. But it was in the farthest corner of the store. But Lou oh. had seen it and tried it and liked it and asked, said, you might want to try that. And I did, and I loved it, and I bought it, and that became the bongo sound. Was that Rickenbacker through a very distorted amp? Well, it was it was blessed. It was by, blessed it by was Lou. Yeah, by Listen, course. just by him directly. Not take his right. advice. Just from pointing to it, made it sound awesome to right. me. Right. So I loved that guitar until I destroyed it later. But it was it was my guitar for the bongos the wow. whole the whole time we did it. Incredible. Group. And that was Lou. That's when I that's when I met Lou. And then when we signed to RCA, we were label mates. Right. So his so did wife. You remind him. All, oh, I met you no, he store. remembered. He, he remembered. knew. He no, no. I might have had to remind him. That's right. true. That's true. Uh, but his wife Sylvia had brought home a promo copy of our first RCA album to him, and he liked it. Wow. And he called me. He got my home number through RCA. Of course, it's easier to ask your A and R guy what's Baron's right. phone number. Right. <laughs> and he called me, and I was like, Lou, I was really knocked out. That's and we, amazing. We started talking about engineers and sounds and cables and studio and all the gear he that he wanted you, to be friends with you. We became good friends, and he actually right. he asked about the studio. We had just used which was called skyline and he, do i recommend it to him and i did and he did and he made his next album with our engineer and at that studio which album was that it was called new sensations oh right mm-hmm. that era okay that era but you know how awesome to be in touch with lou at that time so we started Incredible. we kept in touch from then until two weeks before he passed we were still texting right you know and i saw his last event which was a book event with mick rock right. who i work with a lot too at john Varvatos. So. yeah you, were you there at that i wasn't there no. it was nice well mick rock told me you better you should come tonight and i said yeah but i'm so busy he said, no you should really come tonight right because lou was ill and he knew right that maybe that he won't be uh doing much like for a while, you know. Yeah. So that was the last uh, public appearance. Yeah, and didn't you do? Did you work with Hal Wilner too? Yes, like, I did. Like, did. You did tributes and stuff. Like I did. That I loved like Hal. And Hal yeah. I loved Hal, and then I got to sing a lot on, of course, his T Rex tribute. I sang with Lucinda Williams and with, um, well, actually, one track that didn't make it on the album with uh, Marian Faithful, mm. and um, I sang with uh, Kesha, mm. and with oh, oh, that was fun, and Todd Rundgren, on that album. That's the T-Rex uh, tribute. It came out last year. The, uh, the uh, angel-headed hipster. Right. It's called. Yeah. That I was guess that Hal. was his last. It was his last. I was a fan of uh, Hal since the Nino Roto tribute in the eighties. Yeah. Which was an experimental uh, look at the soundtracks of Fellini films and other films that Nino Roto wrote the scores for. Yeah. Is that was a, the concert he was doing? There he was did, a concert, and then there was yeah, an he album. He asked me to do something on that. You would have been good for that. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, and I um, regretfully, I like said yes and then i it was like in italian a lot of it oh yeah i know i know and it was just and i had so much it's hard i know was i had so much going on and i hesitated and i was like i don't know like i'm I'm just i'm like i ummed and awed basically and then i came like two hours later said no i can do it and he goes i already got somebody else i'm sorry you know 
Yeah. So it's a it's a little bit of a regret, especially since uh, you know obviously he's passed away. Yeah. So That's suddenly. Confused. Yeah. So suddenly. Yeah, but it's weird because on his Instagram, it's a, like the last post is like I've got some dying to do now or something. Oh, I didn't know. I didn't see that. I was, yeah, there was some like weird him. like uh, premonition and like you know post I didn't know. there like I didn't know it was like that a Three Stooges thing, but it was like about going to the other side. Wow. Yeah, really weird. I'll have I don't to check know, that. I don't it's still know there. If it's still there or not? But oh. it was there. And wow. It, it was like bizarre. That's bizarre. But like, I mean, that that is. The world we live in is bizarre and it's, I know. it's getting increasingly bizarre and these things of like synchronicity and just like signs. And I mean, it's like, yeah, I you know. know, people will, you know, say that's mental illness or not. But I think these kind of things, these the blurring of like the spiritual realm and the material realm are happening more and more emerging, you know, yeah. merging. Mm -hmm. Right. I mean, um, it's it's an interesting time to be alive. I know man. it really is. <laughs> I, I feel like we're it's fortunate because we're seeing a lot of change. We've we've seen a lot. We're seeing a lot of changes in the last couple of years. You know? yeah. yeah. Oh, even in the last few months. I know. Man, I know. Just, I'm feeling that too. It's, yeah. It's it, it's increasing. Yeah. It's it's an increase. It's uh, who knows where all this is going? I don't know. I mean, do you have any kind of bug out uh, uh plan? <laughs> like uh, an mean? RV full of uh, can, uh, full of canned goods and no, water. No, I don't. I don't. I'm West, Vill West Village guy over here. He's yeah, good. yeah. But I mean, Waverly yeah. Place is my. Waverly uh, yeah. Place is my <laughs> <laughs> what happens when the food shortages yeah. come in the uh, you know in the? Uh, well, maybe the village has to become a tobacco field again or something or a farm. Yeah. You know. I don't so know how much does this factor into what you're doing now, which is writing a book. What, well, what's the nature of the book? This everything? book is a Greenwich Village story. Mm -hmm. Let me put it that way, and it's yeah. a it's a history book. It's a music history. Right. Oh, great. <clears throat> yeah. That sounds great. What's the title? Well, this title of this book is Music and Revolution. Okay. Well, it's perfect for now. And you know that because that's been... what we need. Music is the <laughs> thing that's going to save us now. I know that. Yeah. And you know what it did in a way? It was it came in handy in the '60s. Right. And it's going to come in handy now. Yeah. Yeah. So the book is based on, on that, uh, but it has a lot of my own feelings about things. Oh, really? With the music, too. Yeah, it's a pretty personal book. Hmm. And uh, I'm just, I'm on deadline kind, now to get it in. Kind. I'm doing, I'm visiting you today as a very special occasion because I m mostly have been just writing. So what's your writing schedule like? It's 24-7, basically. Just 24-7. Yeah, because seven. It, when I'm going, especially when I start wanting to fall asleep, it's when I get an idea to, oh, wait a minute, I got to right. add something. And I go back to the, my desk, you know? Yeah. So um, it's been, it's a lot. There's a lot of information. And, you know, because I've worked with so many artists from different eras of Greenwich Village, including Tiny Tim, mm -hmm. and then all the ones that, I performed a show in Central Park in 2018 called Music and Revolution also. It was mm -hmm. a concert with John Sebastian, <clears throat> excuse me, and uh, Jesse Colin Young, and Jose Feliciano, and, Mel and uh, Melanie, mm. and Maria Moldauer, and... Jenny Moldauer. Jenny, well. Jenny, of course. Oh, and it was... Shout out, Jenny. Yeah, I love, I love Jenny, yeah. yeah. I love singing with her. In fact, when, on, the, on the Hal Wilner project, we uh, often sing together. Right. We do a little, we have a vocal blend. Yeah, what a singer. I know. Yeah. So, yeah, so that album, I got to work with a lot of the artists that I'm writing about. So it's, pers it's a personal story because I worked with them. And the things that they tell, some of the asides mm -hmm. inform the story. Mm. Like Jose Fel Feliciano telling me that they, they all hated him, which is not true. But because he was a virtuoso. Mm. So he thought they were jealous. Yeah, but they were not. They loved him. It's about right. the venues in the, in the village or yeah, about music and revolution. Everything. So you, when Everything. you came in, you mentioned Cafe Bohemia. That yeah. We're in now. Cafe what Bohemia was, was a great venue. Can, what is the history of well, Cafe, Cafe Bohemia? Bohemia I, mean, I, don't, I mean, I forget what happened before, but I know that Charlie Parker lived across the street. That's the and story th this I heard. became a jazz hotspot. I mean, there are, you know, the thing about it is I teach a class at the new school. And most of my students are jazz students. So even though I'm, I'm often teaching about folk singing and rock, sing, you know, ro yeah, folk, yeah. rock, m mixing, um, the jazz students, I always feel I have to show them what was happening with jazz at that time. And a lot happened here, right here in the space. That's there's what some, I heard. 1955, some, yeah, 1959, yeah. Now, maybe. I, I, usually teach, like, uh, I usually teach a course about the 1960s, but I still have to set it up like what venues are here and what inspired people and the bohemia was a very popular venue yeah there's um, it's great the story i heard from somebody who works here was that charlie parker lived across the street he did he did and he had a bar tab he couldn't that's pay. It. that's exactly and right. he said i'll pay off the bar tab if you let me play here and they built the stage and 
everything and he passed away before it could open but there was already a buzz about it that's probably exactly and right then, yeah, yeah that sounds uh, right like miles played here in 1956 yes and those albums on the wall were apparently all recording recorded here the jazz messengers and yeah. mingus and uh that photo of one of miles's albums was taken in this building the one where he's all in red yeah but wasn't recorded here so i see but this was like a mecca for for jazz for it was. like five years or so yeah it had a little window of time but you know i i was just surprised when i went online and found you know live at the cafe bohemia on youtube yeah and i was happy to see that they kind of reopened it for um they tried they tried to have singers because they contacted me about suggesting some people so i did i gave them a list of people like well you could get you know so and so mm -hmm. but i guess it didn't really it, it COVID hit too yeah but they were struggling even at the beginning just yeah. to, but good people and they let us use the space it's great we, it's a classic space to use here yeah it's great for you i mean it's a good good venue for you yeah well it felt like a blessing when it came when it came yeah, yeah. it's like kind of like when you do something like start a podcast there's so much energy and this is like what episode 130 130 and our guest is richard barone wow. an hour and something in <laughs> wow. we haven't introduced him yet no richard barone, <laughs> richard barone. <laughs> thank you thank episode you episode 130 <laughs> wow cool i get a, i get an even number like yeah. that yeah, yeah. It's, a big, it's a big milestone thank you it's great yeah. i'm really happy to be your big milestone yeah. well, we're thrilled to have you man i'm you really know, happy to do it it's, it's wonderful but it's like there's so much energy you got to put into something like this i know and they'll have the stick to itiveness yeah to keep it going yeah yeah there's like the uh, you know more towards like fate and the universe painting the way like these things open up and they kind of give you like the when this club came for us it was like okay we're supposed to keep going because it was also during you know this whole crazy well we, we got in here half. yeah but we got in here in november of 2019 so mm -hmm. we were in here for a couple months that's good before that's good. So in, in, in all those Greenwich Village places, so the bottom line is included in, is that considered no. Greenwich? No. Yes. No, it is included. It, it, it would be, but my, my story is focusing on a little earlier. Oh. Because uh, the bottom line opened in 1975. So you're really only doing 60s. I'm really focusing on a certain era, yeah. And mm -hmm. was Dylan playing oh, in the yeah. 60s? Okay, so we'll share a little oh, bit yes. of that yeah. for those of us. No, it's a very stuff. important part of the story, but, uh, but my, my goal in this book is to shine a light on all of the artists and not just one, you know, because there's some amazing talent I, that I discovered also that I that should be like household names. One, for instance, is a was a an artist named Paul Clayton. Have you heard of Paul Clayton? No. Genius and a big inspiration to others like Dylan, mm -hmm. who would he was like in a way like Tiny Tim, not not like Tiny Tim visually or or vocally, but a mu as a musicologist mm -hmm. who would study obscure eccentric, eccentric obscurities and perform them. Paul Clayton was a genius at that, and he was the most recorded young folk singer of the era. Right. And yet we don't know about him. So I'm making a point to make sure that, there is a, that the spotlight is moving right. and that we can get other people into the spotlight on this book, you know? Because they're awesome. I mean, they're worth knowing about, and incredibly worth knowing about, and inspirational, and fun, and interesting, and you know, they, it would all it didn't it worked because of that community and the way they were interacting mm -hmm. not because there was a star like it wasn't about a star being like bringing all the attention being that's not the main thing the main it thing well, it was a movement and it was a lot of people a lot of characters and they, they were characters and that's how and why the Greenwich Village became a thing right. it wasn't because just somebody got famous and it was important like that like that spirit of revolution that spirit that with through this creative endeavor you could actually shift things positively and and turn people's minds on and all that and like we you know not to be like that old curmudgeon but <laughs> we've just lost like we've, we've lo we lost we, that for we, sure we've lost we that. lost that like like yeah. and and i feel it feels like it's been systematically taken away from us more than oh yeah more than we've lost it it feels like it's been systematically taken away it and, absolutely and, has and, and it and it's still to the degree it's still here still feels under attack Listen, they were starting, they tried to destroy Greenwich Village physically, mm -hmm. itself. Right. That was That's like, interesting. when this was happening, when this, and it was a revolution, because these artists, besides being musically revolutionary, mm -hmm. were political. We know this, right? Yeah. They, the city of New York tried to just bulldoze several times, at least three times, but with bulldozers. <laughs> 
They wanted to build a highway. They wanted to wipe out Washington Square Park. That was the center of where all the folk singers would hang out. Mm -hmm. That was going to be an on-ramp. Really? Oh, yeah. And that was going to, first it was going to be Fifth Avenue, like plowing through the middle. That failed. The neighborhood was like, no, we want a park. Then the next thing was, well, let's just wipe out all of the Italian neighborhood, like the south of Washington Square. And they did some. Mm. They did some. And then that, the neighborhood, again, up in arms. But then they wanted to just wipe out the whole village through Soho, up down through Chinatown to put it to what was called the Manhattan, Lower Manhattan Expressway. Yeah, Robert Moses was the, the, it was the guy pushing at City Hall for that, you know. And, um, and the neighborhood says, no, right, we live here. There was no preservation back then. No, right? the preservation came in 1967. Oh, okay. Yeah. That's interesting. Yeah, so before that, it was like, well, let's, let's get rid of it because, you know, there's a lot of trouble down there. <laughs> there are beatniks and there are interracial couples and there are all this shocking stuff, you know, going on. And um, the village was the heart of it. Yeah. Mm. And the music and the, and the focus of, in the press of radical kids you know right so it was yeah they was like it was slated for destruction but they the village uh defeated it yeah yeah but what's so confusing now though is it's almost flipped on like what you're not allowed to speak i know it, it, oh it, it's all a, an hour we're, we're, really fucked yeah yeah which is just like <laughs> you're not like now it, we're totally it's so, fucked. It's, so it's kind of just like it's confusing because what you know like it kind of flipped on us <sighs> Didn't it was it? intentionally flipped somehow. I think. Yeah, yeah, or something. I a, like you know what's left is right. What's right is left. What's it's a free, mess. You're not allowed to say freedom. If you're say freedom, you're a redneck now. I like, know. It's just like, what's going on? Like in free speech, it's like, it's like wait, the side I thought I was on is the one that's against free speech. I know. Like I know. What side am I on? Like this you know, is why you know what I'm saying. It's like I, I and and then. Uh, yeah, it's just weird, man. We're in a crazy world right now. We're in a crazy world. You speak up, too, and you get attacked by yeah. I know. the side you thought you were on. But this happened in the 60s, too, in some ways. Wow. Phil, Phil Oaks sang about that. That's why okay, he has a song called... Phil Oaks had a song about Love Me, I'm a Liberal. And he's <laughs> talking about the hypocrisy in folks that say they're liberal. Right. Like, it's the, like let's the, check out the that ones song that now. say they're liberal are the ones that say you can't say anything. Yeah, well, check like, out his song. How's that liberal? Exactly. Like, Check out then, his song. Yeah. Like, I'm, Phil, I'm, I'm lost. Like, like, yeah. You know, like, because I'm, I'm into freedom. I'm into free speech. I'm into free expression. Me too. I'm into nuanced conversation. I'm into like la letting people share different ideas and debate without shutting people down and deplatforming people and all that. Like, once you get into that, man, it, you're, you're not far from real dark realities emerging. I know. That are that there's plenty of historical precedent for. Yes, of know? course. And then also, it that side gets masked in the righteous. That's the other thing. It's yeah, like, we're the righteous ones. You better not say anything. Like it's like, huh? yeah. You know, I think you know what you're saying is so true. Right. But Even I me saying that is dangerous. I know you're by very, the way. you're being very dangerous right now. I I've been doing Poppy's that lately. Poppy's gonna cancel us. But that's right. I'm trying not to. Man. No, but, but that it's dangerous. You know. But you know, I'm I'm historically, there were sim there are parallels. Right. With well, things that have happened before, because in the 50s when the folk movement first started, in my mm. book I make I talk about the folk movement uh, a lot, and one thing is when it started in the 50s, you know, it was pretty communist. Right. It, but that was like, I worked with Pete Seeger, and Pete was, the, that he was communist, but Pete was, it was anti-fascism. Right. It was viewed as anti-fascism. Right. You know, it, that again, during the 50s. Antifa. And, the, you know, that I just, I, did, I, I, I led you there, but yeah. Right. <laughs> I, did, I intentionally led you to that. I, I, inten I intentionally led you there, but yeah. Right. And so, uh, so you know, Pete Seeger, Pete Seeger was, founded Antifa. Founded Antifa. But they were against. Yeah. They were. They were. They were literally against Hitler. Right. right. Well, literally. That's not a bad thing to be against. No. I'm all for no. being against Hitler. They were against Hitler, and you know, there, there was a, there were songs about Hitler's grave, and they, they were writing there that he was in the Almanac Singers here on 10th Street. It was uh, Woody Guthrie was in the group, and Pete Seeger. I mean, what a band that was. It was like a folk super group. Right. And their songs were overtly political. Right, and this land is your land was like banned or censored yeah. or what But was... that gets questioned now too. People right, are saying like right. Native Americans are saying, Yeah, this land was our land. 
Well, exactly. So you know everything. But I mean, that's what I'm saying. Yeah, like, I know. Like now it's well. I know. Now Pete Seeger's the bad guy. It's like I'm just saying, I know. Like, like he's like, wait a minute. Take you know? a deep breath, Richard. Like, I'm be, taking it. I'm taking the deep be, breath. It would I know. be interesting to see where he stood nowadays, though. Like it yeah. would be interesting to see if he would call out the hypocrisy or not. I think he would. I think so too. And, I think he and would. I think there's precious few of us that are willing to risk life and limb and career and everything to call out the, that hypocrisy yeah and and that is the spirit of revolution hey and and the way to do it is through comedy but also through music yes especially hey. through music yeah and that's what yeah. we need to do i know right? i know that. yeah that's the fuel to it that's the fuel and that they knew how did it progress from the 50s well wait let him yeah. say let him say what so it progressed say. until they were blacklisted right well, I mean, the 50s. Canceled. yeah, a a canceled. canceled. They were uh, Pete Seeger was Pat Se uh, Pete Seeger was blacklisted for 17 years. What? Canceled, and he couldn't go on national television. He just did local stuff. But that's the, good to hear. But this, the the that's the, a long time. Again, misery loves company. <laughs> yeah, I love hearing that. <laughs> but, Sorry, Pete. I no, he was blacklisted. Who blacklisted him. It was the, the wait, government. Like? Yeah, basically, yeah. It was it was the the House uh, uh, Un American. Oh, wait, the House. Uh, on the H U A H U A C House Un American Committee, House Un Activities House Un American Activities Committee, sorry, and uh, and voted they voted and blacklisted. Yeah, and they had they had senators on their side. They, of course, McCarthy. They had, they, they, it was there were there were McCarthy. They, but, you know, it was it was what was called McCarthyism. But yeah. the actual uh, group that did it, there was a group that uh, they, there was a book, Red Channels, a pamphlet that got around yeah. that listed people like Harry Belafonte, Pete right. Seeger. Uh, a bunch of uh, it's a similar thing that's going on right now. It's all it's all different, but it's it's. But similar. there's a, isn't it, that's what I mean? And, it's and to parallel. To clarify why I say that uh, it's good to hear that he was blacklisted because he survived that, and it, oh it, yeah, it's heartening to know that artists and people can survive. You know, yeah. seventeen years of being blacklisted. Yeah. It's like, yeah, and he was able to perform still in schools and smaller places, right. and those kids grew up to be the folk singers that were the folk wave that we know. Yeah. The 60s ones. Yeah. You know who else they tried to cancel? Jesus Christ. I know. I know. <laughs> they were hardcore about how yeah. they tried to cancel him. <laughs> you know, it's it's that's what I mean. There are parallels to what's going on today in right. different ways. And yeah. the more recent one might be the what we're talking about about that that era in, in the in the village. You know, that had a lot had a right. lot of that. And so the blacklist was was um, severe, but he did come out of it. It was the Smothers Brothers who then put him back on the air, I believe. That's interesting. And Johnny Cash had him on a TV show also. So they saved him. They, they kind of brought, yeah, because he was completely banned from national television. So he, with his own funds, put together his own television show called Rainbow Quest. And if you check it on YouTube, it's really great. Pete Seeger's Rainbow Quest TV show on a local small budget, wow. like it would be like public, public access. access before public access. It was like I'm public, check that out. and he had amazing guests, including Donovan, including uh, you know m most of the folk singers that were became really well known. I don't. Yeah. Dylan wasn't on, but many many of them are on Rainbow Quest. This makes me love Pete Seeger. I know you it, should love I, Pete Seeger. I love Pete yeah. Seeger. So what was the reason, what was the official reason of his cancellation? Do you know, or was it a, a plethora well, of things? It was a plethora, it was, the blacklist was a, was a thing. It was a serious thing. The networks were uh, not only hesitant, but they refused to book artists that were listed on the blacklist. Okay. And he was convicted, Pete was convicted of uh, contempt of Congress. Hmm. I think that's the word. Don't quote me on the actual um, yeah. conviction but I think it was contempt of Congress mm. because he refused to name names right they said well who else is a communist you know what I mean yeah and he's and he said who have you they said like who a witch hunt. yeah it was a yeah total witch yeah hunt. and they said who do you have you sung for and he sung I've sung for the Rockefellers and I've sung for and in hobo jungles yeah I've sung for everybody I'll sing for you now Isn't and he brought his banjo he brought his amazing. banjo to the hearing he said I'll sing for you now and they said that won't be necessary humanity is so weird I know man. come on humanity and he was the most like, gentle of all the artists Pete Seeger was the most gentle he was like Mr. Rogers well like again it goes well, what did we start this whole interview out with? What did Tiny Tim say? Like, speak. Uh, 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 easy, um, speak. Uh, do what is right, and your heart will be light. Right. right. So he was peace. He, he was hard. His heart his was light. His heart was probably light as a feather. He was light and as that a world came he was, down. He was dude. doing what he felt was right. <laughs> that world came but down with a to hammer. It. But he, he did. stuck to it. Like, if I had a hammer. But he lived to He that. wrote, if I had a hammer. I mean, yeah. That, that, yeah, that hammer. Yeah. Yeah. That's funny. Yeah. 
you know. Yeah. So, you know, it, so I got to, working with Pete was great. I, you know, but I've been, like we were talking about, like where I've been, it's like, I've been fortunate to work with so many heroes. But Tony you know, Pete, Visconti. <laughs> Visconti. Visconti was, it was always my favorite producer. You, you, you know, I manifested love, him too. Hey, you know, it's not just, I love, of course, his T-Rex works are my favorites, but I mean, even Sparks, his group, the group Sparks that he produced. I mean, there's so many interesting They're records. They're kind of really amazing. They right? are, yeah. yeah. And you know, but the Bowie records are so just rich with a range, like the arrangements are so cool and uh, fantastic. It's Visconti, you know, and he was a great uh, collaborator for these artists. And I was thrilled to record and write so many songs with him, you know. Was and he it, still producing? Oh Visconti? yeah, sure. Oh, yeah. He does stuff all the time. Yeah. I mean, even recently he's gotten, well, you know, he did B Bowie's last albums. All of those are done by Visconti. And he, you know, that was just up until 20s. Dark Stars. Bla Black Star. Yeah. Black Star. Black Star. Yeah. yeah. All of the last albums. Interesting. Last album. Yeah. That last album. I know. Did you work with Bowie as well? I, just, I, got, to, uh, tw I got to sing on two tracks because of Tony. No way. Yeah, yeah. I got to sing. In fact, one record that we sang that I, we did in the 90s just came out this year, 2021, on Bowie's birthday. It's, it was a cover of John Lennon's song, Mother. Wow, really? It's really intense. And they put it out as a special, like white yeah, vinyl he had single. A trippy thing with his mother too. It, Bowie yeah, did. see, that's why he that's did it. I'm glad you know that. No I one do, knows that. I do know that. Yeah. I know. I, I'm well aware of it because I study the whole narcissistic personality disorder, and ah. I've, I've tuned into Bowie's thing with his mom, Hella. Yeah, Hella yeah, yeah, yeah. I, like, Expand. I'm always, I'm always trying Picking to figure out what what has screwed somebody up. To make them a genius. Yeah, well. A genius always has that, something. That's a big part of it. Yeah, that's, that's a, a big, big deal. So listen to his version of John Lennon's Mother. Oh, it's, it's on, to, oh, believe me, I'm going you to. You can hear it on YouTube. And that's Tony and I doing the backing vocals, which, wow. which are kind of doo-wop. We kind of like did this guy thing behind him. This like right. We had just watched a movie called The uh, Comedian Harmonist about these during... Um, during the Hitler days, there was a group mm. of Harmon of Jewish singers, and they were later uh, not able to sing anymore. But they, the great documentary right. about this singing group, and they had a unique harmony sound. Mm. So Tony and I said, let's try to you know, do that. So we have this beautiful harmony mix that we did behind Bowie on I that song. I can't wait to hear that. It's, it's really nice. And I did a, another track that has never been released, but as you can see, they come out with his catalog slowly, things are released. So. I think the other song. Did you meet him? Oh yeah, of what, course. What yeah. was he like? Super nice. Super I met him. I met him first. Mr. Bowie. Mr. Bowie. I met him first, <laughs> very, very casually, at a club called Hurrah when he was in a play in New York called The Elephant Man. Oh, okay. He was starring in a Broadway show, and a Broadway play, and um, he was going to check out a band that my bass player was playing in called The Zanties. They were awesome. And Bowie was just hanging out in the club. It was not even that packed. And then I looked over, and he was next to me, and I was like. Are, David Bowie and he goes yeah and we should, you know that's when I first met him mm -hmm. but we didn't really work together till through Tony years later mm. you know was interesting that, was that your secret hope that through Tony you'd get to work with no. Bowie no I just I wanted to work with no, Tony I mean, Tony's uh, I just uh, Tony work. enough on his own man <laughs> I just want to work with Tony Tony's legendary like I mean, oh, as producers so, go, he's as legendary as Bowie. Right, but I your mean, reaction that when was, Tony said, yeah. listen, we're going to go I was thrilled. On Bowie. I was nervous, but thrilled. But I was nervous. I was like, uh-oh, okay, I better sing good. <laughs> you know, right. you know. But Because uh, Bowie does his uh, records in one take. You know, Bowie doesn't come in and just, he's not like, you know, you don't do like, the, he just does his vocals once. Really? Mm -hmm. Maybe doubles it. Sometimes, but yeah. the main thing is he get like when we did the session for, for that I saw, when I, the sessions that I was at, he would come in and sing and he would do it once. Perfectly, mm. and then he would say, "Is that okay, Tony?" Tony say, "Yeah." And See you later. And that's that. <laughs> yeah, that's crazy. Because he did it as a perform. He was. It's great. I tell my when I when I teach. I don't right now. I'm just teaching the music history. But when I teach performance, I bring up that story because you know the you prepare before, then you do it like if it's in front of an audience, yeah. even if you're in the studio. Yeah. You know, you do a performance. Like we talked right. about records and what make, makes an album. A part of it, I think, is the performance and how real the real performance yeah. on that album is. Great records are made by great performances. That's yeah. like uh, Peter Gabriel's thing for his Real World label. I know, and that was your one early signing for yeah, Real World. I know. Signing, yeah, yeah, you were great. I knew that about you, you. Yeah, and I was really, I was uh, admir admired that because I know how Peter Gabriel, what a, you know, he's, he didn't just pick everybody to be on his label, no. so you were very, that's very good. <laughs> yeah. I know that, I thank know that. Thank you, thank you, no, yeah. I know that. <laughs> yeah, but that is really true because also like, you know, you give that performance and yeah, you can hone it in, but that there's the mystical juju magic on it is, yeah. is all over that first take. <sighs> you're so right. So if you're rehearsed and you know it, 
you get the best of all of it. You get the you get the magic and you get the enough of the perfection. Yeah. But you also get the discovery. Yes. You know, like yeah. I, I, I like I got this thing with the the Brian Eno thing about like when when I love if, Eno. You know, and yeah. he and he had this thing where when he would record background vocals or any kind of vocals, he would do it without ever hearing the track before. Oh, and cool. And so getting, like, getting that reaction. I like that. And I utilize that a lot as cool. a technique. And that's, I've gotten a lot out of that. That's great. That's a yeah. good technique, yeah. It's a really good one. You yeah. know, if you're, especially if like somebody sends you music, oh, you want to co-write, and mm -hmm. they want you to do top line stuff. Mm -hmm. it's, it's good to like the, your first time listening to it is make sure you're in front of a mic, make sure you play record and hit your first phonetic sounds and little weird word choices because they become really significant. That's a good point. Yeah. That's a good point. I yeah, like because that. Because your mind isn't engaged yet to get in the way of mm -hmm. the subconscious information. Yeah, I get it. I get yeah, it. Yeah. I'm thinking of records that might have that that I never thought about before, but uh, Iggy, Pop, Iggy Pop. Right. Uh, the Idiot, Idiot album yeah. has some interesting backing vocals that seems totally spontaneous to me. Well, yeah. And, and I think, I have a feeling they just didn't listen to, they just like, just I'm off the cuff. I'm sure. Yeah. I, you know, I, I'm sure that that's the case. So tell me about working with Gary Lucas. And oh, the God, that was interesting. Gods and Monsters. Yeah, I stuff. love that. That was, that was a, a interesting time for me. Um, because he's I was such a great guitar. He's player. a great I mean, guitar player. And you know, I was playing Mellotron. Right. So this was, I had a Mellotron. I had bought it in the, in the early nineties. How yeah. big was it back the first then? Sampler, big. It's basically. a big monster. It was a big, well, big monster. Yeah. And gods and monsters. The, <laughs> one of the monsters was my Mellotron. That is a monster. It was out of control, but it has a motor, you know, it's yeah. like having a oh, car. It's not like the keyboard size today. That no, you no, no it. it's a big thing and it's got tapes in it. It has so tapes. Like, you know, it's like well, the Beatles, like strawberry field take stuff. Take it to the flute on Strawberry Fields that, or whatever, that's Mellotron. Uh, yeah, it's so great. It's and got it, a great sound. It's a great sound. It's very heavy. But so it's also clunky as hell <laughs> and hard to keep maintenance on and goes out of tune. Or oh, probably, you know, just like, you know. What I had, so Gary had me, because you know, he doesn't really sing much. Gary and his right. show will sing a few songs, but I was the singer. So I'm singing and trying to keep the Mellotron in tune. So there's like, there's like a pitch wheel where you can keep it in tune. Right. So I'm trying to sing, and the songs were difficult mm -hmm. with a lot of words, and I'm trying to sing and also keep the Mellotron while I'm playing it in tune. Mm. So it's like, <laughs> great, because I'm, so, okay, I'm listening to Gary, who plays, who has nebulous tuning anyway on his guitar, because mm. he's playing wildly. In, in alternate tunings. In alternate tunings. Yeah. So I'm trying to t make sure that I'm in his you know, world of tuning yeah. while I'm singing. It was, it was a fascinating, like multitasking performance mm -hmm. uh, situation to be in. <laughs> You yeah. know, was this the same t same time that Jeff was in the band? After, after. I knew them with Jeff. I knew Jeff, and I knew them with the Jeff. And then after Jeff passed, Jeff he said, uh, "Jeff Buckley, I, I." He asked me if I would sing it. At first, I felt very uncomfortable, yeah. but he, but I said I wouldn't do any songs that Jeff was singing. Right. I couldn't. Yeah. So we did other. I did other ones. Yeah. You know, and I wrote a couple with Gary, and um, and we did. We did ones that, that were not associated so much with, with Jeff Buckley, Buckley saying. So then I right. felt like, okay, I'm doing my own thing with Gary. And we would just perform t as a duo sometimes. And we would do, we would do live radio shows. Uh -huh. <laughs> and it was, again, live radio. So, you know, you talk about the performance and that edge thing you're talking about, about yeah. being like in the moment. Right. It was all in the moment. So it, with the added feature of the Mellotron monster mm -hmm. trying, to, trying to wield or trying to control it, you know, but yeah, yeah it was is, fun. That's a spiritual practice. Like yes. when, when you're in the moment like that, because that is the whole course of meditation and all that is getting in the moment. But if you're th talking about being in the moment, go on live radio with some stuff where you don't <laughs> know what you're doing. It's a meditation. With everybody listening. You get in the moment. man. You know, when you mentioned meditation though, I started during the nineties, especially I started approaching everything like if it was a meditation. Yeah. Just everything I did is a meditation. If I'm writing a book, I'm in deep meditation. Right. If I'm writing a song, I'm in meditation. Yeah. If I'm singing on stage or in on the radio, I would go into meditation mode. I'd yeah. prepare myself as if I was meditating. Right. And then I'd be in that. And that I would perform in that state. Right. And I think I did good work in that in that when I the more I do when I do that I think I do better work. Well it's the full the full breath of your being is yeah, there when you're just, present when you're like right here yeah. right now. It's like otherwise if you're like thinking about the past or worried about the future then you're just scattered all over the place your power is like yeah. dissipating. The only time I can't really do that is if, if I'm producing an event which a lot of people like sometimes mm -hmm. I have to really be like hyper 
hyper, hyper, <laughs> hyper. Well, thinking about all you know? the things. Like I started. But, but with, even in, within that, mm-hmm. then being in the yeah, future then, and the then, past becomes part of being in the moment of yeah, that particular yeah. task. So in a way, it just gets tricky. Get past. I was thinking, and I was talking to a woman last night that's, that had been at one of my shows I did, and my first big concert at Carnegie Hall was a tribute to Peggy Lee. Mm-hmm. And there were about 18 amazing singers Deborah Harry, I had Shirley Horn, all these jazz legends mm-hmm. and, and younger characters, but mo- a lot of legends. And. Um, you know, uh, I juggling it was, I, I had never done that before with so many characters and there, it, there were so many moving parts, mm-hmm. you know, and that's, that was like, took me out of the meditation mode in a bit, you know, that was 2000, um, mm-hmm. 2003, I did that, that show, but it, it came off, but I had to, I meditated to create the show, but then mm-hmm. in that when it was actually on, I'm hosting a show like that, mm-hmm. just keeping it rolling was tricky. Well, the nature of that is scattered energy. Yeah, it really was. I mean, that's like, so that's, you're in the moment of scattered energy. Yeah, because they would, some of them didn't make it, like, you know, uh, like, well, B. Arthur was supposed to be in the show in New York. She did end up doing it. Is she really your aunt? No. She would be. I was wondering. <laughs> but I wish she was. She was great. Yeah, her real... Amongst my other real aunts, by yeah. the way. I'm not trying to cancel my aunts. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> B. Arthur was one of my heroes. I always loved her on television anyway. Yeah, me too. And then I saw her on Broadway. And when I was working on this Peggy Lee tribute, I kind of figured she... I thought she'd be good in it in yeah. something, you know? So she was. But for the New York show, she was ill. So she couldn't make it at the last minute. After we had already rehearsed her um, uh, doing her song, which was going to be Hey Big Spender. Yeah. So at the morning of the show, this is what I mean about breaking out of meditation. So in the morning of the show, I get a call from B and she goes, really deep voice. I don't even have a deep voice. Richard, I can't do it. You Richard, know? So I can't do it. I said, B, why? What's up? Because she had just done rehearsal the day before and it was awesome, but she wasn't feeling well. So I mm. said, okay, okay, I, I get it. So I didn't know what to do. So in that moment, I just thought, well, hey, big spender from Sweet Charity. And you, don't, you, know, you already mentioned that I know mo- musicals. I do know some musicals. Right. Okay, so written by Cy Coleman. So I said, I gotta call Cy Coleman. Now he was older. Yeah. I got his phone number and I called Cy Coleman. I said, Cy, I need you in the show to sing Hey Big Spender. And right. he did it. Wow. So he said, he came on stage and this is Cy Coleman, the great Broadway writer. He just said, well, I have bad news. B. Arthur can't make it tonight. But I have good news. We both wear the same dress size. That's right. <laughs> yeah. well, that reminds me of what a, gu- a guru said to me once. What? He goes, you kind of remind me of a golden girl. And I said, what do you mean? He goes, because you should just be Arthur. That's really good. I'm just kidding. That's just a funny that story. <laughs> I just made that up. <laughs> I still got funny, it. I like uh, it. You, do have, you still got it, boy. <laughs> like, hey, that's good. Right. Yeah. That's a, but she was a great She was very funny. She was like that, though. She was really funny. She was very funny to work Maybe with. Maybe she is your aunt, Joe. Maybe. She on was a, like you. On she a was spiritual a bit like you. level, she, she was definitely a, is. She was a bit like you. She was really great. I really miss, you know, she she passed not that long after I after we worked together, but she was just great and she did great at the hollywood bowl she mm-hmm. really knocked him dead yeah. well i'm working on a musical right you now. are yeah the ballad of boogie christ wow wow yeah i was wondering because christ see it's been on your he's been on your mind oh yeah yeah definitely he's always on my mind yeah right yeah now. i get it yeah. i get it I yeah nowadays he should be on everybody's yeah mind. no i know seems like he's coming back i know i know soon. i know i seems agree like with he's you on his way back i agree right? i agree you really are you a christian yeah you, i am yeah. yeah me too yeah i am a uh, christian yeah. with chutzpah yeah. I, well, yeah. You know? Of course. Bro. Yeah. Of course, bro. I am. Yeah, but so, like, so is that part of like, I mean, do you mind talking about this stuff? I know it's. Well, a, I know it's a weird. I have a really mixed. You know, I love spirituality. Right. And I have, and I, I was raised Catholic, and I'm still. I attend mass. Right. But I also have a Jewish part of me. Right. And so when I said Huspa, I was serious. Yeah. So I really have a mixture, like Tiny Tim, except his was even more extreme because he has a his father was Arab and his mother was Jewish. Mm-hmm. So Tiny Tim had a real, you know, but I so I yes, but I really I'm, you know, I yeah. I, I go I practice yeah. I practice you know you pray and stuff I like do that. I pray I do pray every single day. Me too. I pray every single day, and I have a very specific. It's it's part of my meditation. It's yeah. a part of my meditation is prayer. Yeah. I love prayer. I pray before I perform. I pray before I do anything. Do you, wow. listen, to ser- yeah. do you listen to sermons ever? Yeah. Are you Joel Osteen? Yeah, I have heard Joel Osteen. I yeah. like him, yeah. man. I'm sorry. I know he, like people think he's cheesy, <laughs> no. but I, just, I love him. I listen to a lot of different things, you yeah. know. And you know, then I decide what I really uh, want to want to go with. But I, right. I, I like to hear a lot of different things. Yeah, me too. But I was I would uh, in my book in Frontman. I talk about you know how Say the I full title. 
the front man surviving the rock star myth. Yeah. And you Available know, on Amazon. Uh, it's on Amazon. Yeah. yeah. And the, they, the publishers backbeat book. They're awesome. You know, good publisher. And they're doing my next book. But, um, I was, my first job in Florida was working in my church, right. a Catholic church. And I was a sacristan, which yeah. is the person who prepares the things for the priest for mass. Yeah. And they were Jesuits and they taught me a lot of stuff. Right. And they were very open-minded about about going to other churches of non-Catholic right. for me to learn yeah. from. Yeah. So I started doing that. I started going to all kinds of different churches. Yeah. Pentecostal. Yeah. You know, and trying to, and I had, I would go to a synagogue. You know, uh, I would, you, I would try to get, as, I would try to learn as much as I could about every, mm-hmm. of everything, and yeah. be, and just to know, and try to see where the you know what what was going on what resonated with you the most yeah yeah well it's interesting because these times are pushing me towards that belief more Mm -hmm. and more so it's like because of what's going on Mm -hmm. in the world i feel like there's uh so much energy pushing me in that direction Mm, interesting like like because of yeah like i feel like there's so much of a of a push away from that that it's pushing me towards. I get that. it. I get that completely. But you didn't I, grow I, up with religion. Not at all. I, my no, my parents were not overly. By no, the way, I happen to get that no job religion. on my own. Yeah, I didn't yeah. have. I didn't have. I didn't have much in my house. No religion. You had zero. No. Zero. Zero. Yeah, I had not. Zero. I had like and, a little bit, but they yeah. were not. Uh, you not, sought it yourself. I sought it myself. Yeah, me too. But you know, Jesus had. Uh, you know, there was more going on than one thing because he was. I think it seems like he studied other other traditions besides mm-hmm. i mean it wasn't just one thing yeah and he i think he understood like hindu is i think he understood buddhism right i think he understood other religions i think right. you know there's like a missing time in his life that i feel he was studying yeah i think that's all i'm not a, i'm not a historian i'm not an expert right, but it seems neither. to me there was like a, a gap in his years where he yeah, third book should be about yeah i would love it but i feel he studied other religions huh. and that's where i am yeah. i like to be you know what I mean? So, informed. so yeah, I like to be informed. I like to see where, where you know, I work. I know Buddhist people, and they've they've taught me a lot. And uh, yeah. you know, mu- some of the musicians I work with are Buddhist. And I, I really think that that sort of fits right in with. That isn't. That's not against Christianity to me. Right. One of the things I struggle with because I love yoga. Yeah, I, I do too. There's like a lot of. I know people, you do. I knew that about and, you. And yeah. there's a lot of people that think like, okay, if you're like, no, I love it. If you're a Christian or if you're like, you know, you got to be careful with yoga. Like it invites Hindu gods and this, that, and the other. There's a lot of people that are against that. I don't think Jesus would have been afraid of Hindu gods. <laughs> yeah, you don't think so? I don't know. I don't think so. But like, I think people, yeah, they like they they, they mean that that means you're disrespecting Jesus. I don't. Something. I don't see that at all. I've done yoga no. since I was about. 13 right yeah interesting i used to do much more of it and of course yeah. uh it's great to see the different types of yoga i learned later like mick mm-hmm. rock does uh, kundalini right before photo sessions no i know that have you but ever worked with uh, have you worked with uh, of course yeah 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 and plus i do like <laughs> he was on the podcast twice yeah, good twice. We, i like him a lot mick. he's a mick. great character great, yeah. he's one of the best yeah shout out mick rock <laughs> mick rock and the second the time he called us could do you want to do it again and, and we're like we, yeah wow yeah we still have to get those paintings but that's digression but like I do the Wim Hof breathing in the morning, which is kind of a form of Kundalini. Yeah, like, yeah, I know. Westernized Kundalini kind of thing. I yeah, mean, it comes from that. But you no, know, you have to have some spirituality. Like Lou Reed, as as you know, as Lou as he was, you know, he was tai the Tai Chi, chi was his chi. spirit was a very spiritual I guess thing. He did Tai Chi on the day he died. Yeah, that's what I, I know. Heard. He did. Yeah, I went. I got to go to a couple. Uh, sessions with his master mm-hmm. you know because they were trying to t- tony visconti was also and with the same master so mm-hmm. they were uh so i got to go to w- well a few things and one was tony i see i did i always thought tai chi was a very slow moving mm-hmm. and it can be uh meditational yeah, movement slow based. Mo- but when it goes fast have you did you have you ever seen the tai chi in in full uh-uh. full force no. uh-uh. i need to get there it is it's super fast right and all of those slow moves that are studied yeah. go into hyperspeed huh. and it's 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 a kind of violence like you've never seen because it's, you don't touch you don't have to even touch someone the the power of the chi power right that was chi right that can be just by the by the force of will huh. can knock someone across a room wow. that's what i saw the master ren that's his name that was his master master ren, yeah. master ren could knock someone across a room just by the just by the thought it seems it seemed to right. me right and i saw uh tony and his son 
in Tai Chi sort of matches and it was like super fast wow. and sliding across the floor and stuff. It was like, really? But it was in the Tai Chi moves. It's just super fast. And do you study that stuff? No, I would love to. I want to one day. I want to too. Yeah. Maybe we should go do a we Tai should. Chi class. I think that would be serious. I mean, really serious. I, focusing. I would do that. I yeah. Mean, I, you know, I could use that. I would use that. I would do that with you. Yeah. yeah. Wow, man, that's interesting. So tell me about your thing with Nick Drake. You love Nick Drake, too, I do don't love you? Nick Drake. I, you know, and it's been a while. I did perform in a great, beautiful Nick Drake concert that Joe right. Boyd was involved with, who, who was his producer. And I sang, you know, Nick Drake was um, a really unique... I feel his influence was really... Uh, got into the music industry in a lot of different ways, yeah, subtle really ways. Did. But Elliot he, had, he, Smith, yeah. And know. I think Bowie. I, I really think a lot of artists got a lot. Mm -hmm. I, I do. Did. I do hear Donovan in his music too. Like yeah. on the other side, as far as influences, I do hear Donovan in his music. Okay. But uh, and it's just so sad that he didn't live very long. You know. Right. Like back then, though, like there was that thing of just like if, you know, by the time you're 27, it's all done I anyway. Know. And he was 26, I guess, when he passed. That and, young? And, and, yeah, he was. Oh yeah, super young. But then you gotta think like Jimi Hendrix was twenty seven. I mean, they're Jim all twenty seven. Twenty seven. Yeah, the twenty seven. Janis Joplin. Club, 20, Janice, you know, Robert Kirk Johnson Kirk was twenty seven. Yeah, so it's like it, it, nowadays that seems like insanely young. Yeah, but like then, yeah, it honestly didn't like even Mark Bolin like was in his like thirty one. No, twenty nine. Twenty nine, right? Yeah. But but his whole thing too, there was this I think a sense of disillusionment yeah. that led him in that way. I think like. Nowadays, we know that we can just keep like sort of reinventing Absolutely. and reinvigorating. Yeah. And, like, you know, it's, yeah. it's, uh, yeah. How do you, what do you do to keep, I mean, because you're ageless, by the way. <laughs> Thank you. you. Know, I, like, Thank what you. are you, 32? I, yeah. It's like, you look 32. Yeah. I don't know how old you are, but we've talked about a history. So that makes me believe you're older than 32. Well, you know, but, for, but like, so how do you keep your energy, your spirit and your youth like that? Tell people, tell the people because the people want to know <laughs> and we're, and we're here to tell your story, but we're also here to help. Right. You know, you're on, you know, for me, and it's, go. And go. It, to me, it's, to me, it's all one thing. Like when right. you said the word yoga, I remember when I first right. learned what it meant, it's like the, that union of like the body mm -hmm. and spirit and the soul and the body. Yeah. I I think it really is all one. I think the way you live your life has a lot to how well your body is maintained. Yeah. And it has a lot to do with, like, I don't keep many secrets in me. I kind of blurt everything out. Right. Even today, I've been telling you pretty much everything that, I mean, I, there's been no yeah. se nothing really that secretive about it. Right. I like to be really open and I like yeah. the, the those tiny Tim words about heart will be light, you know, do what is right. Yeah. I, I try to live by those certain rules that, that, that don't give me a lot of added stress. Yeah. That's one thing. Yeah. Secondly, I really do believe in like physical ex I like to go to, I go to the gym. Yeah, clearly you keep in shape. I go yeah. to the gym. I like I it. Love it by the well, way. especially when Mick Rock photographed me nude, I had to start hey, like <laughs> When Mick Rock photographed me, I took my shirt off. I know too, that. By the way. I know. You're I had, awesome. You know, I, was, I love it, but that's you yeah, know But you should. Like why, why not? not? You should celebrate that stuff. I love it. So you've got a nude photo. Completely, yeah. Man, yeah. Nice. Yeah, and it's the book. My book cover was new. Of course, now they've sort of shouted me a little bit in certain specific areas because mm -hmm. it's a textbook, also in some schools. Because you don't want to, you don't want to overwhelm. <laughs> no, no, no. Sure. I know that's true. That's <laughs> true. <laughs> true. Yeah. It's like it's, some things if it's, are best uh, left. You don't you know, want to. You don't want to. You'll freak them out. You when know, something is too, when it's something is too good to be true, they'll think I've had plastic surgery or exactly. something. Exactly. You know? <laughs> But it's also that it's celebrating yourself too. It's like, I like making that. jokes, but it's like it's true. It's like celebrate yourself. This world is yeah. hard, and it does try to beat you down. And yeah. So it's like you have to, you know, champion yourself. Yeah. As well, and that's not that's not narcissism. Narcissism in the ugly sense is when you're trying to hurt. Yeah. Or mess with other people. No. Narcissism in the healthy sense is when you're celebrating yourself so that you can show others that they should also celebrate themselves. That's exactly That's right. That's what it is. And it's mirroring. I'll be your mirror, as right. Lou wrote. Yeah. You know, but also, I think celebrating yourself and also rewarding yourself. When right. you, like when I finish a chapter, I do something fun, whether mm -hmm. it's, I don't know, anything. Getting just uh, It could be just even watching a movie that I should I should actually be writing, but I just go watch a movie right. instead. Yeah. But I reward, I think, I think rewarding yourself is good. Yeah. Celebrating yourself, rewarding yourself. I can say that that feeds you, it feeds you right. to do things like that for yeah. yourself and not to be afraid of doing that. That. Th those are my main things. I just I, I do work out every day. I love running and I like 
I like being outside and just playing. It's the best. I've man. always liked that. That natural, that natural immunity, and yeah. like getting sun, getting vitamin D, yeah. going on runs, making sure you get lots of oxygen. Yeah. It's like it's all those basic things. These are the things that that you know somehow now are even controversial to mention which, i know which you have to go like what what's up i know man? like like you know no matter what your stance on the uh highly controversial things that are happening right now yeah which i won't even get into yeah. right now because you know yeah we're in too good of a mood I yes feel. exactly but like you know to be able to celebrate building your natural immunity yeah. and your exercise in your own god-given perfect like you know it's perfect creation like we're perfect we are perfect i do believe that mm -hmm. and and i believe that like of course if you do nothing towards building your immunity or just if you do nothing towards building your friendship with somebody or mm -hmm. towards your own body or your own soul it's going to go to hell i know like that is the nature of things you do have to lean into things you do have to have discipline you do have to work towards making, you have to meet things, you have to meet God's creation halfway. That's a good line. Yeah, that is a good line. I heard line. that, I felt that coming. Yeah, you did. I, I saw felt you, that coming. I saw I was you like, feel okay, that coming. You're going, you're going we were, there. We were kids. Yeah. yeah, yeah. You have to meet God's creation halfway, but yeah. if you do that, yeah. man, it's amazing. It's beautiful. Right. You know, and music is a way, it's another way to kind of do that too, because that's physical, mm -hmm. sexual. Yeah. You know, I really think music is sexual. The, yeah, absolutely. Rock and roll is that it's part of why it's there is because it's a sex it's a union of sexuality yeah. and musicality I think you know and uh, folk music has some some of it not as much as rock and roll right. but I mean but it, you know, the really good stuff definitely has it's the, sexual yeah, yeah absolutely well just that energy like I retain yeah. I retain my semen like you know like I know that's like <laughs> TMI or whatever <laughs> you but retain it I retain yeah like, yeah definitely yeah. Like, is I it don't, like I don't waste it any I mean I've gone I've many a years have wasted it believe yeah that. I'm like, sure yeah, <laughs> yeah, yeah <laughs> I'm like, sure and some of those years were okay it was sometimes some fun stuff but yeah I've learned that if you retain it yeah that's that like tantra that's tantra it's tantra that energy yeah. will like will manifest itself in other ways yeah that energy that there'll be m m a stronger vibration in the music a stronger vibration in the podcast a stronger vibration in the painting it's true a stronger vibration i agree you know it, it's, it's, all it's sad to say but it's absolutely true yeah and there's a great line in a woody allen film when he's having right after he has sex and he goes there goes another novel and that's really what it is <laughs> i really believe that do you retain? Uh, sometimes. Or is that it's a too personal a question? No, no, it's not too personal. Okay, good. Uh, sometimes. I do understand that. I do sometimes, yeah. but not all the time. No, not. Because I'm so hypersexual sometimes. Yeah, you know? yeah. No, yeah. not all the time. Yeah. I don't think you're supposed to all the time. Yeah. But I think like. It's interesting. It's an interesting idea. And I do think about that. I do think it's just something it's good to explore. And, and people that. <laughs> Well, there's a whole I never would have imagined that we'd be talking about retaining our semen. We're, we, we've gone, we've covered so much. <laughs> I think Tiny Tim would have approved oh, of this podcast. He would have been all. He, he, would he be was like, Let's retain, dedicated to him. He, retain, retain your semen. He had, he had. <laughs> Tiny Tim had trouble doing that though. Oh, retaining. Yeah, because he would have. Um, well. Mm. He would. They would have to have an extra. When he did a television show, supposedly he'd have to have an extra pair of pants handy. Because he would have uh, premature, he would have ejaculations on stage. Wow! Really? Um, we'll talk about yeah. TMI. <laughs> I'm sorry. No, I, I didn't I'm mean sorry. that. Oh, that's great. I didn't, edit, no, edit that's it not, out. No, but that, I mean, we ain't editing anything. But out. I mean, that, tiny. That's from a, the book. I mean, it's something that it was an. It's it was. Amazing. It's actually. I'm not just making that up. And he didn't tell me this. This no. is something that actually was in the diaries and stuff. Right. That you know he the, he was so turned on by uh, uh, women around him. Right. That he would have just a spontaneous. Right. That's the word. It's not premature. The word would be spontaneous orgasm. Mm -hmm. But that's that engine of sex feeding into yeah. the music. And who knew it sounded like that? I know. It's so funny. <laughs> he was such a unique character. That's why right. I do recommend the documentary. Yeah. yeah. What's that called again? It's called King for a Day. King for a Day. Yes, yeah, just out. It's, I just saw, yeah. I saw it in a theater. That was my first theater since they were closed. But it was on uh, at the Film Forum. Right. Uh, no, no, it was at the, the Quad on uh, 12th Street. In New yeah. York. But it's, it's, it's going to be on, on Prime, Amazon Prime. Yeah, and uh, I don't want to keep you forever, but what, <laughs> the, the, your your first book that you put out. What? That's called Frontman, Surviving the Rockstar Myth. And what does that title allude to? Well, I started thinking about b being in the music business as I sort of related it to Greek mythology at one right. point. And sort of seeing the characters as kind of Greek myth, myth Greek character, gods. Greek gods, well, and how they're... You Jim know. Morrison, Dionysus. Yeah, but then also I started seeing, you know, the, you know surviving that myth. 
yeah. was something I had to learn to do. And in the book, the, the survival, really Tony Visconti had a lot to do with it. He doesn't even know. Mm. But that, collab- that coll- yeah, I, I actually, I have tried to, but you know, the collaboration that I had with him pulled me out of this idea of being a front man, mm-hmm. which is fun and right. sexually exciting and everything, you know. Yeah. But also I love working behind the scenes. Yeah. And collaborating with him especially was like a, a, a manifestation of just not necessarily always being the front man, even if I am the front man, right. even, if I, even if it was my album we're making. You don't have to identify. Yeah, just like have fun making music. Mm-hmm. And, and you know, we would just collaborate. People would drop by and we'd, they'd collaborate with us. Right. And that, uh, that experience was uh, part of a way to survive the manic energy that happens when you're a front person of a right. band. Yeah. Uh, but I'd, all, I'd been working on that for a while, but that's when I really realized it, working with Visconti, um, that, 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 that that was making me survive. <laughs> you know, not being always, when I was the front man of the bongos, for instance, sometimes I was just, I put so much pressure on myself, not only for myself, but because I felt responsible for the band. Hmm. You see what I'm saying? Absolutely. And that became this pressure on me that made me have end up in the hospital several times. Wow, and got ha- that deep, huh? Yeah, and I would, but you know, I'd, I was on tour, so I'd be in the hospital, but then I'd have to be- Stress or drugs? Stre- or? A stress, mostly. And mostly then, stress. which would trigger asthmatic reactions where I couldn't ah, breathe because I was so stressed. Right. Like, how am I gonna sing tonight? I've just Anxiety been doing 300 attacks. shows in a row. I have no voice left. <clears throat> yeah. Do you see what I mean? Yeah, absolutely. And then- I've I'd, been there. Yeah, it's scary. And so I, I was losing it, you know? That's why, the, that's why the band kind of, that's why I started doing those more gentle folk shows. Mm-hmm was in a way part of that survival like I, I you know i couldn't do that every night at that time anymore mm-hmm. you know i had done we did like seven years on the road of maybe averaging 300 shows a, a that's, year that's but the bongos so, that's yeah the bongos too, played a lot too many we played a lot from that's a, that's from 80 to 87 because that's when i did that album and yeah. then i did yeah. then i got the acoustic thing out and i just did, did a different kind of vibe like i said with the remember with the crystals and, yeah. and i just vibed it out and made something like a, a different kind of evening of the music yeah. was it less stressful yeah yeah it really was because i felt especially having women in the group like having men it wasn't just all this testosterone it was women the women equaled out the testosterone yeah. so it was like there was two guys and two girls and the women were keeping a we had a balance i know this sounds ridiculous well nowadays you can't find testosterone on a football field <laughs> i know <laughs> I'm, just, I'm here all day <laughs> That's funny. but you know what i mean like the male let me just say the male energy yeah, yeah. and the female it was fun to have a show where i wasn't like competing with these guys or just doing something like at a, right. it wasn't like a sporting event yeah it was different it was just like a whole other thing it was like a social event yeah so being on stage with them we would like laugh and talk and right in the middle of the show who cares right. we'd have a total thing like a social circle going on on stage it was different than being in a machine mm-hmm. where the band had become a machine yeah. And I have happened to be like the motor. Mm-hmm. So that was, uh, so that's what I meant by surviving the rock star myth. It's kind of seeing that we're human mm-hmm. and that, you know, there's ways to, the way to survive it in a way is to put less focus on yourself. Mm. That was my, my thing. What that, I, what isn't it funny how the, the artist's life, the artistic life is kind of like kismet to like a spiritual life and that you're the, the, dissemination of your ego is the, is what led to your survival. Yeah. And yeah, it's the same yeah, thing I mean, with like being a spir- on a spiritual path. It is. It's the same thing. Yeah. It's very spiritual. You know, but, but for me, it was like, I mean, I feel I have some level, I have ego, but I just, I don't think that's of course. the only thing. Like, I think no. it's kind of cool to kind of spread the love a little bit. And, Bro, it's, an ba- it's a balance. It's like yeah. you, your ego is like a, a, a tool that's out there doing like, it, it, you, you know, you need to sort of, uh, yeah, you, you need that structure. To, to get through this world and to put yourself out there, you yeah. have to have some ego. But, yeah, yeah, of course. But but like like in the Matrix, the ego's out there like almost as an avatar. Right. It's not really who you are. That's exactly right. And that's the thing. It's yeah. like or like what Jesus said: be of the world, but don't be in the world. Yeah. Or be in the world, but yeah. not of the world. You're paraphrasing. You're, I'm yeah. paraphrasing. Yeah. <laughs> JC, excuse me. Right? Yeah, yeah. But there's a there's a beautiful book when you're speaking of Jesus. There's that one. There's a beautiful book. I don't know if you have it. You can find it. If not, I'll loan you my copy. It's the gospel according to Jesus. You know, mm-hmm. we know all the gospels according to everybody else. Mm-hmm. But if you just just take just what he said, mm-hmm. it's a beautiful collection of... I'm going to get that. That's all you need. Right. Because, you know, the other stories are great. And they're great right. parables and things. But they don't really come from him. Right. 
the but it, but to, to Jesus. Jesus. It's so yeah. simple. It's like if, when you first when look at it, you say, well, well, don't we, doesn't everybody, we don't ever all have that. We have people like talking about him. Yeah. Saying, oh yeah, and then he did this and that, and they're a little bit different. Everybody has a different view. Yeah. But then just hear it from him. Yeah. Because those are the ones that they have researched that are from him. I'm going to check that out. It's beautiful. You'll love it. Well, I'll tell you what, man. You're beautiful, and I uh, love you. Uh, you're beautiful, I, and I love you. I, I really appreciate you coming on. Oh, I really enjoyed it. This has been... I hope it wasn't too rambling for you. Bro, no, this has been one of the... I don't want to wrap it up with him, because I have Okay, well, I'm going to go to the bathroom obviously. again. Go I'm, to, like, I, I've been, I'm on a fast well, just, oh, no, I do. just hear my question before okay, what you go to the bathroom. So. Ehud always likes to wrap it up. Well, no, because <laughs> there was one guy... He always gets the I see the show. I watched your show. I like it. I like it. There was... So you manifested Bowie, Visconti, Lou. Yeah. Seeger. Seeger. But you also were hanging out with Andy Warhol, so please, when he goes to the bathroom. Uh, <laughs> well, I want to hear the Andy yeah, Warhol. Exactly. I can hold it. Go how, ahead. How can we not you bring know, up Andy? We have like, to bring up That was Andy. my first stop in New York. I was at, When I first wow. visited New York, so before good I actually call, moved here. Good call. Andy, good come call. Come on. <laughs> a, year oh, <laughs> a year before I moved, a year or so before I moved to New York itself, or, or, or for real, I visited. I was, that was like a year before, so I was still in high school, of course, and I visited that summer before and just cased the place out, like where are the club, where is, it, where is everything, am I gonna really move here, whatever, you know. And the first place I went was, was to see Andy, and I, he didn't know me, but they, now this was. You could just come and go see no, Andy no, when you came to New no, York. No, I, like I had to schmooze my way, I had to, I had to charm, I had to charm my way because, you know, uh, I knew that but there you're was, a star, so he must have been. <laughs> I happy was 17. To see you. I was 17. Yeah. But the thing was that th there was um, he had a new book out, The Philosophy of Andy Warhol, according to A and B. A to B and back again, right? Yeah, yeah. A to Z and back again. A to B. Oh yeah. A to B and back again. That's funny. So you yeah. know, I thought I'd like to get a copy of that, and while I'm here, maybe I can get him to sign one for me. So I just went right to his offices. It was the it was the what what had been <laughs> what was the factory, but then by that point, because this was the later '70s, it, it because after the shooting, right? It was this was like ten years after the shooting, so it was bulletproof. bulletproof. It was offices, mm. but you know, still like when you arrived, it was a, a little hallway. This was on Union Square at that point. Wow. And you arrive, and there was the cow, one of the cow paint. It was a piece of the cow wallpaper. So it was like already awesome. It's like, you know, there's the cow head, you know, and um, the pink and yellow, I think. And a door and like all bulletproof. But, you, but within the bulletproof glass, you could actually watch and believe it or not, on the floor yeah. of that, but you could watch him. He was doing, they were doing silk screens. In fact, they were doing hammers and sickles. Wow. That was the, he was doing prints. They were quite cool communist like That's hammer and sickle lows with the with the hammer and sickle sort of in different positions yeah. so they were screening these huge so i was watching in amazement and fascination and then at some point i just knocked on the glass now he didn't come right but the woman who answered the door um just said you know what would you like and i said i just wanted to get can i buy a copy of the philosophy of andy Warhol? and she, i was a kid and she lay, let me in yeah well then i was in and I was hanging out with him. I'd go the next day. I bought the book and I signed. Right. He signed it for me and also drew a Campbell's soup can. Wow! And I have it. You it's, still have of it? Of course. That's not worth much. And it's, he drew the can for me on the whole first title page. Incredible. And signed it, Andy Warhol. And it was uh, the date. He put yeah. the date and everything. And uh, and so then I kind of hung, hung out. And it was you know it was, I, I they would let me hang out just be there. It was not it was it wasn't the scene that would have been in the sixties. Right. But, but I was just happy to visit. And sometimes I'd go to lunch with some of the people that were hanging out. And, you know, I got to meet some people, I think, but it's all vague to me, but I think I might have met Danny Fields back then. Mm. You know, you know, Danny? Oh, yeah. 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 That's a great documentary is his. Yeah. Yeah. But, but I, I, don't, I don't, I can't even tell you too many details. I was just like there for a couple of days just visiting and I'd go just pop in. Yeah. But the first day was my, that was my first day in New York was That's to get the book. Story. That's incredible. And he was very, and then later I started seeing him because believe it or not. Kansas it's a, City or? That was, no, I also saw him with, later when the bongos were playing it, there was a great club called the Ritz. And they would come there. The like, original on 4th, 13th Street? The, the Ritz was on where Webster Hall is. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, 11th. And Warhol and his crew would come by there, and we were playing. It was awesome. It was like, oh. And we saw him, at the, we, I'd met him several times um, at the Limelight. Another so it was like hi and you know, he remembered it and it's like you know it was like just like hello you know he was very quiet kind of you know you can imagine it was, it was Warhol yeah. <laughs> you know kind of like the conversations were I was not there were not very many words <laughs> it was high you know and it was like and he'd always carry copies of interview with him luckily I got to be in an interview once uh, on, on 
It was nice, yeah. Did yeah. you interview someone? Hmm? No, you? we got me. They interviewed me on uh, one of my records I made, and uh, it was cool because they were so clever. They had a beautiful photographer uh, photograph me, but also the, they gave, the headline was Between Heaven and Cello, and that became my next album. I had a record right. coming out in Europe, and I said, let's call it Between Heaven and Cello. I thought that was a good phrase. That's a good one. Yeah, they had good people there. It was, it was So that was my excitement. It wasn't much. I didn't like go to his house or anything like that. It was yeah, just yeah. at the factory which was really the interview offices and it was very elegant as I recall my memory of it is it was like I you know you think of the funkiness of like my, the couch and the scene like when the velvet underground right. Right. but this was more it had gotten to another level it was yeah, like yeah. a big business it was it was point. a big you know yeah. interview magazine is still in print I, I guess you know it's a great it's a big business and and he built that yeah. he was ama he's an amazing hero to me yeah I wish I could have done more with but what could I you know it's like he was doing his thing you know it's like what I like about him. And then him, he died in 87, that yeah. year that I made that album. Yeah. Oh, really? That's yeah. interesting. And yeah. Especially because of the title. It's kind of interesting. Yeah, I know. The relationship but he was, there. He was always like, you know, in the background, like anytime I think of visual design, I always kind of think, what, it's like, what would Jesus do? What would Andy do? I think of him a lot. Yeah, the style. Not as much as Jesus, but no, close. No, I know. No, I know what you mean. But close. I, I think know of him mean. a lot. Like, and and just his whole thing of like when you know make stuff and while everyone's telling you how bad it is make more stuff I yeah mean, you you could take away a lot from that with this whole way the world is right now just like yeah. do your thing speak your mind and while everyone comes down on you for all that keep and speaking your mind keep it's doing true. your thing he always said that and yeah. you know one thing he, the advice he gave to lou and to others he, lou thought he was the smartest guy in the world i think he it's pretty close yeah. to right, if not exactly right. Yeah, so but but you know what uh, he would say like to, to you know what like what should I write about? So write about like what you love. His yeah. his that's because I think that's what Andy's agent told him. Like when he said, "What should I paint?" Yeah. And he goes, "Well, what do you like?" He goes, "Well, I like having Campbell's soup with my mom. Like every day, his her, his mother would make him the Campbell's right. soup." So he said, "Well, paint that." And then what else do you like? Where the depth comes from. It's like I love money. He liked money. He I wanted. He money. needed. He needed it. Yeah. He needed money. He's like I need. I like money. So I said, well then paint that. And he did. It's like those. Like some of his early paintings were just things that he really needed or loved. Wow. Yeah. It's just what was sustaining him. Interesting. So it's so. And that was what he told. What he, what Lou like Lou wrote about what he was interested in. It's like they just. It's so simple, but it's it like we forget that. But we like, complicate it. When we collaborate, you and I, yeah. like it should be things that we love. Yeah. I'm down. I can't wait. <laughs> it's a good place to wrap it up. All right. That's I beautiful. love you guys. I and gotta let's go. give a shout out to a friend of all of ours, Chris Seafried. Okay, Chris, Chris Seafried. I oh. worked with him. We did a, yeah. a he produced he, a beautiful version of all. Uh, I love Chris. You worked with him as well? Oh, yeah, yeah. He produced my last record. Beautiful. He's a great yeah. producer. We did All yeah. Tomorrow's Parties just as a tribute to Lou. Yeah. yeah. Shout out, Chris. Right. Seafried, if you listen to the end, we love you. Okay. All right, all right everybody. Richard, <laughs> thank you, Richard. Thank you so thank much. Thank you so much for what having me. What a treat. I really enjoyed this. What a great podcast, yeah, yeah, right? I love one, it. one of the best. Like, yeah. We, yeah, anyway. All right. Okay. Bye, everybody. Thank you. Support us on Patreon. Subscribe and uh, Press like, like and subscribe <laughs> and comment and comment nice things. And uh, wait, Richard, where do they find you yeah. quickly? Oh, richardbarone.com and Instagram, Instagram, Richard Barone, Twitter, Richard Barone, and your books on Amazon. Yeah, and the new book is going to come out. I think it'll be in 2022. 2022. Yeah, Richard Barone. Thanks so much. Check him out. Thank, Thank you. you. Hi, this is Joseph Arthur. Thanks for checking out Come to Where I'm From. Please support us on Patreon, patreon.com slash come to where I'm from. We are an independent podcast and any contributions you can make are greatly appreciated.